Good evening. Just want to very quickly give a warm welcome to you all. I'm glad that so many of you were able to make the time and also, you know, the travels that all of you have had to take to get here. So again, I'm truly grateful that all of you could join us uh, for this debate. Now, the debate interrogative, you know, have the New Testament charismatic gifts ceased? So again, this is going to be a really good debate. I really pay that a lot of you carefully pay attention to how these both of these ministers elucidate what they believe to be the word which constitutes our salvation. So again, we're truly grateful all of you here could join us. I want to very briefly just tell you a little bit about the debate guidelines. I want to share with you a little bit about the debate guidelines, but also introduce to you our moderator and then introduce our first speaker. So very briefly, about the debate rules, for those of you here that have never attended a debate before, what we're going to allow is this, is opening introductory statements. Each speaker is going to have 20 minutes for the opening introduction. Then there's going to be a time of rebuttal. That will be about 12 minutes each. Then we're going to have a time of cross-examination where they're going to challenge each other's presuppositions with the word. So at that point, that will be roughly about 15 minutes. And then we're going to have concluding statements, which will be about five minutes and then here comes a wonderful opportunity for you guys to be able to ask the speaker questions as well. We're going to spend 45 minutes during that time. And please, please pay careful attention to the instructions that we provide because, again, the goal of this opportunity is to ask the question instead of providing some elongated exposition. So, again, if you have a question for your speaker, just kindly stand. And, of course, we'll make sure that each question is rotated in between each speaker so that we afford each speaker the opportunity to carefully explain the response to your question. With that said, I want to quickly introduce our moderator. This is Bradford Smith. Bradford is currently a pastor right now in Clarksville, Tennessee. He's also a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. He just recently retired, I believe, spent well over 20 years, multiple combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's also a West Point graduate. And like uh, Pastor Hines, he also has, I believe, nine children and has been married for, I think, since 2001, if I can remember what his bio said. So again, we definitely want to you know, thank him for the opportunity to be here. Now, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Theodore Zacharides. And during this time, after I introduce him, we're going to welcome him up. And when he comes up, as soon as he hits the podium, the time starts, he's going to have 20 minutes. As soon as we're finished, I'm going to ask the moderator to come up here to introduce Dr. Brown, and then the same thing. So very quickly, I'll introduce Dr. Zacharides. Dr. Zacharides is currently the co-director of Reforming American Ministries. He's also the senior pastor for Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in Tullahoma, Tennessee. He earned his MDiv and PhD at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's participated in multiple debates and has published various books. So with that said, would you please welcome Dr. Theodore Zacharides. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Brown and I have agreed to use first names, so it will not be a sign of disrespect when I call him Michael. Okay, just so you know that. All right. Thank you for that. Um, my position is basically the historic position. And uh, of course, history is not the only arbiter of my view, but it is substantiated by history. More importantly, it's the biblical position. And what I mean by that is, first of all, we have a misnomer with the very terms charismatic gifts, because I understand what people mean when they say that, and so I agree sort of reluctantly to use those terms. But um, when you look at the text, and today my prime text will be 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 begins what is known as the discussion on the spiritual gifts, the charismatic gifts. But when you look at chapter 12, the word that we find there is not charismata, or charismata, or charismata, however you want to transliterate that, but spiritual. Now, in my authorized version, it says gifts as well, but 
the word gifts is not in the original. So the term charismata is one of the ways that the enumerated spirituals are designated, one among many terms. And moreover, when you are looking at 1 Corinthians, you have to remember that this letter is a corrective letter. If you miss this important truth, you will end up trying to emulate the Corinthians when Paul is trying to correct the Corinthians. What you have to understand about the letter is that Paul is dealing with people in the church that were, number one, very, very worldly, and he calls them sarkigi. They are fleshly people, okay? They're carnal, if you will. They're not spiritual at all. They think they're spiritual, you see? And so when chapter 12 begins, it begins with the expression now concerning, which you find several places in the book. And this is because they have addressed these matters with Paul. And they have asked about spiritual things or spiritual persons. Because that term in 1 Corinthians 12 is not the word charismata, it's the word spirituals. And the people that were inquiring of Paul asked about spirituality because they claimed to be spiritual because they had the so-called spiritual gifts, particularly speaking in tongues. Now, if you miss this, if you miss the corrective, if you miss the, the, the particular nuances of what Paul writes, then you're deceived by the English translation, particularly the one I prefer, the King James, because it speaks about, you know, spiritual gifts when the word gifts is not even in the text. Okay? So, this is part of the problem. Not only were they carnal, but they were having factions in the church. They were dividing. Some were saying, I'm this person, and I'm following this person. There was a group that was evidently following Christ. Surprise, surprise. Not only that, but there were other things going on in the church. Licentiousness to the degree that it would put pagans to shame, where a man had his father's wife, chapter 5, what we find is that there's no discerning of the body of Christ, and therefore many of the Corinthians were actually sick as a judgment of God. Not only that, but some were actually dying because of their not discerning the body of Christ. Chapter 11, 10 and 11. What you find is divisions between those who have and those who have not. There were people that were hungry, and then there were others who were bringing food, and they were eating, and... Paul has to tell them all these things about, look, I'm not, I can't praise you. How can I praise you? You're being divisive. You're being carnal. You are not spiritual. It's a very combative letter. And when you read it with 2 Corinthians, you find even more of the same. Even Pentecostal Gordon Fee acknowledges that on every turn, Paul is combating the Corinthians. So why is that significant? Well, because when you get to see what the actual words are in the text, particularly chapters 12 through 14, which is this unit, and I take it as a unit. I don't believe chapter 13 is an imposition. I don't believe it's a poem about love like you have there on the side of your unit up there. You've taken those words out about love is, love is, love is. That's, that's not the point. The point is it's about the gifts. Chapter 13 is not some imposition. Some scholars believe that Paul wrote it, or maybe he didn't even write it. He wrote it for something else and then put it in here. And da, da, da. No, it's carefully crafted, and it is designed to inform the Corinthians that the gifts are going to cease. And I'm going to show you that from the text today. So let's begin in chapter 
12. Now concerning the spirituals. He's about to tell them about what's going on. And the first thing he says, he reminds them of their past when they were Gentiles led away by demonic spirits and has to tell them right off the bat that anybody who says Jesus is accursed is not speaking by the Holy Spirit. What on earth is that about? Why on earth is he beginning with the very thing that is a problem? Well, because he has to address it. Because the Corinthians are some speaking in languages, which is the normal spirit gift of tongues. Others are being led by the demonic and are uttering things that in another language, someone was able to recognize, and they were saying that Jesus is accursed, anathema. On the other hand, if you say Jesus is Lord, you can only say that. It doesn't mean just saying the words. He means believing, affirming, taking on Jesus in one's life as Lord, only by the Holy Spirit. So what the Corinthians were doing, the haves and the have-nots with food, money, status, elitism, and spirituality, Paul levels the playing field and says, everyone who claims Jesus is doing it by the Holy Spirit. What do you think? You guys that are doing these things, showy things, you're the ones who have the Spirit? Paul is saying no. He levels the playing field. And he goes on and he says that there are different Gifts, right? We'll use that term. Paul says that there are diversities of gifts. He says that there are differences of administrations. He says there are diversities of operations. And he says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone. For the benefit of all. This is an underlying theme for Paul, particularly when you get to chapter 14. Igodomi, igodomi, igodomi. That means edification. Edifica- everything is for edification for the church, for the whole. So he begins to list these, and once he lists them, what you find is. Uh, Tongues doesn't fare very well. Starts off with, if anyone says Jesus is accursed, and then lists the gifts, and tongues come right at the end, which is significant, and you'll see why in a moment. From this listing, he moves to the illustration of the body, which is the problem that the Corinthians were having. They were not a unified body. There were schisms, et cetera, et cetera. So this is pretty, I'm going to assume that this is pretty self-explanatory, and uh, we're going to move over to when he says at verse 29, uh, or rather, let's, let's look here at verse 27, rather, because this is the conclusion to the illustration of the body and the members, okay? He says, now ye are the body of Christ, Okay, so he's reminding them who they really are in Christ, and he says that God has set some in the church. Now, you've got to remember, in verse 11, it is God who sovereignly appoints the gifts. God sovereignly appoints the gifts. It's very important. And here again, in verse 28, he says, God has set some to be, the first thing, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Last, again. And, more importantly, he says, well, are all apostles? No. In the Greek, The way this question is framed demands a negative answer. So, no, not all are apostles. Of course not. 
Same for everyone he lists, including tongues. Not everyone will have tongues. And then he says this, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, that translation is faulty because after pointing out the problems, after enumerating the illustration and outlining the gifts and putting tongues at the bottom, which was the prize gift for the Corinthians, it would be a contradiction of Paul to now tell them, after he's designated the Spirit as the sovereign that determines what gifts are given to whom, to tell them now, you seek gifts. Because this is a mistranslation of the original. Zilute in the Greek can be an imperative, it can be. It's the same form, meaning it's a command. Paul is telling them, do this. But better, according to the context, is seeing this term as what we call not an imperative, a command, but an indicative. Paul is saying, this is what you are doing according to your estimation. You are seeking what you in your minds think are the best gifts, and the adverse is, but I show you a better way. So what you have is, you have Paul correcting them, chiding them, which is the tenor of the entire letter. Then, after telling them this, he gets into the more excellent way. The, the love chapter, right? And what is the first thing he says? The first thing he says is, if I speak the tongues of men and of angels. Tongues now is number one. Why? Because tongues is the problem. It's last in the enumeration, first in his discussion here. And that is significant. And of course, he goes on and he tells them that basically if I have all these gifts and I don't have love, then it's really worthless. So love is not designed to replace the gifts. Love is the sphere in which the gifts must be manifested for the edification of the whole, the body. And he goes on and he says this. Charity, this is what charity does, suffers long, is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself, unseemly seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices, rejoices not in iniquity, rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Why is that important? Not because there are going to be weddings and you can read this. This is precisely what the Corinthians were not. And in light of that, he says, look, charity never fails. It never falls. That's what it literally means. Bipti. Doesn't fail, doesn't fall, literally. But whether there be prophecies, whether there be tongues, and whether there be knowledge, they are going to cease. But they're going to cease in different ways. First of all, prophecies. Prophecies, knowledge, and tongues in this text are all revelatory gifts. Their gifts, when exercised correctly, are a divine revelation, and the one speaking, either a prophecy or a tongue, which when interpreted functioned equivalently to prophecy, which is always a revelation uh, of, of the stature of thus saith the Lord, not some mixture of correct and incorrect, but truth and the word of knowledge, which is another gift of revelation. So it's all about the partial revelation coming through these gifts as opposed to some fuller revelation that will come in the subsequent discussion. And what he says is that the two prophecies and knowledge are going to be done away with in a violent expression saying that God is going to destroy them. 
Why is that significant? Because the, the force of the term is such that if, if somebody today, a charismatic or a Pentecostal says, well, yeah, 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 okay, they ceased for maybe a little bit, and, and we had to wait until people started believing in them again, and that's the reason why they started up again at, you know, in, in the beginning of the 20th century. That goes against the force of this word. Because the word means when they are destroyed, they're destroyed once and for all. There's no, there's no remnant of them coming back. Moreover, when it comes to tongues, it's a different form of the verb. It's a different word, and this time it's in the middle voice, which means that tongues will cease of themselves. I, I translate it with the colloquial, peter out. They will peter out. They will just stop by themselves. Of course, they will stop when they have fulfilled their correct spiritual and biblical purpose. Not everyone in Corinth was actually speaking in biblical tongues. Some were engaged in mantic and ecstatic speech, thinking that they were spiritual, but however, they were not, as Paul has indicated over and over. So here we go to this illustration that he gives us now, that we know in part and we prophesy in part, but then when that which is perfect comes, that means that there's going to be a contrast from the partial to the complete. The word perfect is another mistranslation. The word is not perfect in the Greek. The word is complete or sometimes used in a sense of mature. However, the context indicates that whatever the perfect is, it is in conjunction with the partial. Ekmeros, dotelion. All right? These two are the two that are compared. The partial and the complete. Not the partial and the perfect, but the partial and the complete. Once you get that down, you recognize that he's speaking of revelatory Revelation. He's, he's speaking of miraculous revelation that is in part infallible truth that's given via prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. That will, in part, will stop. And when the perfect comes, that will be the complete revelation. Now, I know I've only got a, a minute left, less than a minute. I have to wrap this up quickly. Some believe that when Paul says that the perfect comes, it's speaking of Christ. But the term there is never used of the second coming. It's never used of Jesus because it's a neuter term. It wouldn't refer to Christ because it would have to be masculine. And furthermore, the expression face-to-face -face is an analogy from Moses in chapter 12 of Numbers. Um, I'll have to uh, speak more on this later. But basically, when you look at the partial and the complete, you recognize that it's about revelation, and the figures that are used are figurative, they're metaphorical, and they have to be consistent. So if one is metaphorical, the other has to be metaphorical. All right, that's my time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brad Smith. I'm the moderator, and it is my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Brown uh, before he comes and gives his introductory remarks. So Mike Brown is the founder and president of Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina, and the director of the Coalition of Conscience and host of the daily radio show, The Line of Fire. Dr. Brown holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University, and he's the author of more than 30 books and has debated Jewish rabbis, agnostic professors, and gay activists on radio, TV, and college campuses around the United States. So please welcome Dr. Michael Brown to the podium, sir. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Theodore, and all the organizers and the host church. And for those who don't believe in God's sovereignty, if you found your way here, he brought you here. So we are thrilled to be here together. Uh, I was invited to debate this topic, have the charismatic gifts cease. So the things we talk about, tongues, prophecy, miraculous healing, did they cease? Now, we agree that the argument is explicitly what Scripture says. It's fascinating 
that you have church leaders for centuries talking about prophecy and healing and miracles. And, and Augustine, about 1,600 years ago, when he was writing The City of God, he didn't believe that these things were still happening. But when they documented more than 70 miracles in two years, he said, obviously, the apostolic miracles and gifts still exist. However, that doesn't touch on the issue. Our question is, what does Scripture say? Professor Craig Keener, in his highly praised two-volume study, Miracles, estimates that there are at least 200 million living eyewitnesses to miracles done in Jesus' name today. But that does not impact the question, what does Scripture say? In fact, if a cripple was healed here tonight, that would not impact the question. And if a televangelist was exposed as a phony healer, that would not impact the question. The question is, what does Scripture say? And it's really open, shut, very simple, to be totally candid. And let's remember, we are sola scriptura people. We believe the scriptures alone are God's authoritative word. We're not Mormons, we don't believe in another book. We're not Roman Catholics who believe in additional authoritative tradition or traditional Jews who believe in that. The question is, what does the word of God say? Now, we know, for example, in the Old Testament that you'd be stoned to death for violating the Sabbath, but with the coming of Jesus in the new and better covenant, we know that's not the case. Scripture tells us. So if Scripture gives me explicit instructions about pursuing the gifts, about the function of the gifts, about things that tie in with the nature and character of God, explicit in Scripture, and then tell me these things will continue until Jesus returns, all of which I can demonstrate very easily by Scripture, in Greek, in English, in whatever language you want to read it, then unless something within the Bible comes and tells me that stopped at a certain point, unless I have something explicit in Scripture, I just have to go by what Bi the Bible says. So let's, we can get into Greek nuances, Hebrew nuances. We, we have respective PhDs in Hebrew and Greek. We can dig into all that. But I'm quite sure the plain and simple sense of Scripture is overwhelmingly clear. So notice what Paul did write. After... 1 Corinthians 13, which we heard read a moment ago, which I'll return to, he says this, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and above all that you may prophesy. And they're both imperative in the Greek, and every translation will verify that for you. So he's telling the Corinthians to pursue love and to pursue the gifts. Why? Because they go hand in hand. Just as Paul corrected abuses with the Lord's Supper without rejecting the Lord's Supper, he corrected abuses in tongues without rejecting tongues and said, in fact, I speak in tongues more than all of you, and the one who speaks in tongues speaks mysteries to God. The problem was the abuse. And he says this, when you come together, each one of you has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. And then he concludes, 1 Corinthians 14, 39, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy again, read translation after translation from the King James on, they'll say the same thing, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. So I need something in the Bible that overrules that. I need a text that tells me, don't do that anymore, because I know it's happening today, I've experienced it, it's been experienced not just for 100 years back, but through church history in different ways. I, I need something explicit in scripture that tells me not that at a certain point in time it's going to peter out because it, it hasn't. I need something to tell me that that's changed. So unless someone can give me an explicit text telling me not to earnestly desire prophecy and telling me not to forbid tongues, then I'm going to earnestly desire prophecy and I won't forbid tongues. But it's not just 1 Corinthians. And again, this is, this is the Bible we're talking about, not a charismatic textbook. Or, this is the Bible. In, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, do not quench the spirit. Do not put off the spirit's fire. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. He doesn't say there's going to be a point in time when prophecies cease. He doesn't say make sure you read this other letter where I gave a cryptic hint that this might happen. He's, this is normative. What's written in Scripture is normative for us. And then James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Please show me where this has changed. Please show me where in the Bible this changed. Give me chapter and verse, because I'm giving you chapter and verse for each point I'm making explicitly. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Did that change? No. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Did that change? No. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with all in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Sozo, which in Luke's gospel is used saving from sin, saving from sickness, saving from demons, saving from death. The prayer of faith will make the sick one whole, save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. 
So every local church should be laying hands on the sick and should be expecting in faith to see healing. That's normative. And it's not even connected with the gift of healing. This is just something we should be seeing, and we're commanded by Scripture to do this. Not only so, the Word of God tells us explicitly how long these things will last. Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit is poured out and the disciples speak in new languages, what, what does Peter say? He quotes from Joel... And he says, this is what God said through Joel in the last days. And he adds the words. They're not found in the Hebrew. The Hebrew is just for Achrechein, but after this, he adds the words, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Not just the apostles, not just the leaders, all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. So the outpouring of the spirit is on all flesh in the last days. What's the period of the last days? Scripture is very clear on it. It's from the death and resurrection of Jesus until his return. We're in the last days now and have been in them for 2,000 years. Not only so, Peter says in Acts the second chapter in the 39th verse that with repentance and faith in Jesus, people will receive the promise of the Spirit and the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. Not only so, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, as Paul is writing to the believers, he said, you are not lacking in any gift. Remember, this is something he praised them for. The problem was the abuse. The gifts are wonderful. The abuse is bad. All right, so he says, you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In their minds, they could be the generation that sees Jesus return. They didn't know there was going to be a 2,000-year period. And he's saying, as you're waiting for this event, not telling them, by the way, before that event happens, like 18, 1,900 years before that event happens, or 1,600 years before that event happens, the very gifts I'm praising you for will no longer be there. No, he says, you are not lacking any gift as you await the coming of our Lord. And 1 Corinthians 13, and again, during my rebuttal, I'll go through point for point, where I differ with all respect to Theodore. Where Paul says this, that tongues will cease, knowledge, he doesn't say word of knowledge, just as knowledge will pass away, prophecy will stop. When? When the perfect, when the complete comes. And then he says this, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in the mirror. Then we'll see face to face. So if you say that all of us have a face-to-face -face intimate relationship with God, that we hear his voice, he speaks to us, we speak to him without any hindrance, that it's not through a mirror, there's no faith involved because we see face-to-face. -face. If that's happened, then fine, maybe these things have ceased. But obviously we await that day when we will see him as he is. Not only so, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am known. Do we know God the way he knows us? Now, of course not. This has not happened, and this will happen when Jesus returns. So we have explicit exhortation, commands in Scripture that cannot be overridden by some kind of prophecy or dream or history or anything. The authoritative word says that we should earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. We should not forbid tongues. The word of God explicitly tells us that these things will continue until Jesus returns. And then there's the aspect of the nature of the Holy Spirit. When we look in Luke Acts, dunamis is used over and over and over with reference to miraculous healing power, miraculous power in the virgin birth, the disciples being given this power to heal the sick. Dunamis comes out of Jesus and heals the sick over and over. Then Luke 24, 49 and Acts 1, 8, same author Luke, tell us to wait for the spirit and we will receive what? Dunamis, power. Same word used in Acts 4.33, with great dunamis power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So the whole purpose of the gifts of the Spirit is to glorify God, to point to the resurrection of Jesus, to edify the body, and to touch a dying and hurting world. These are good things. These are wonderful things, and they glorify Jesus to this very moment. So, so here's the question. Paul spoke about preaching and the power of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, for example, that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power, the dunamis of God. Do we receive the same Spirit? Are we awaiting the same Spirit? Does the same Spirit indwell us that indwelt the apostles? Is it the same promise? Well, then when did the dunamis change? When did the Holy Spirit stop doing miracles? When did the Holy Spirit stop setting captives free? Never. This is the same Spirit doing the same work. Not only so, we understand that healing 
is part of the nature of God. In Exodus 15, he said, Ani Adonai Rofecha, I'm the Lord your healer. In Exodus 23, Vahasi Rotima Chalami Kerbecha, remove sickness from your midst. The same thing in Deuteronomy 7. The psalmist praised God in Psalm 103, the one who heals all your diseases. And then we see with Jesus coming into the, the world that he brings the kingdom of God with him, the rule of God with him. And as the kingdom of God advances, captives are set free. When the sick are healed, Luke 9, Luke 10, when the sick are healed through the preaching of the gospel, then the apostles are to announce the kingdom of God is in your midst. The rule of God has come. I have a question for you. Are we not enjoying the benefits of the kingdom as we pray, Lord, your kingdom come and await the day when he will rule and reign forever and ever? Whatever your end time theology is, we are still awaiting the full manifestation of the kingdom. Right now, Romans 14, 17 tells us that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We are in the midst of God's spiritual kingdom, and that kingdom still advances to this moment with healing the sick and deliverance, because that's what happens. Light shines in darkness. You'd have to tell me that the nature of the Holy Spirit has changed. You'd have to tell me that the nature of the kingdom of God has changed if healing and miracles are not still taking place today. We also have an explicit promise on the words of Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 12, the Greek is very straightforward, the one who believes in me, and that exact phrase is found six times in Greek in John's gospel. Again, very basic and simple. It is a universal promise. For example, in John 6, 35, where Jesus says he's the bread of life, whoever believes in me will not thirst. In John eleven twenty five, 25, the same thing. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. The same thing in John 7, 38, John 12, 44, John 12, 46. Very simple, very straightforward, universal promises stated in the clearest way, whoever believes in me. What does it say in John 14, 12? Whoever believes in me, the works that I do will he do also, and greater works Will he do? Because they go to the Father. And the, contra- the context there is miraculous gifts, his miraculous display of, of, of power. So we can say, well, we'll debate the greater gifts, but there's a reason that the followers of Jesus also healed the sick, also drove out devils. Demons also saw miraculous things t- took place. There's a reason it happens to this day. It's a promise of the Lord. And remember when we're speaking of Jesus, he comes to reveal the heart of the Father. He's often moved by compassion to heal the sick. He says in John 5, I can only do what I see my father doing. He says in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So this loving heart of God to touch a hurting and dying world, this is not just some display for TV. This is not some fundraising mechanism. This is the love of God reaching out and touching a healing and dying world. Yes, many are not healed. We understand that. There were, there were people that, look, in Paul's ministry, he left this one sick somewhere. There's a, there's a man at the, the, the gate, beautiful. How come Jesus didn't heal him earlier? You could debate all these things. Not everybody was healed, and yet it's a full expression of the heart and love of God. And those that came to Jesus for healing, he never refused. I still pray in that name to the Father as he instructed us to, in faith, based on his promise and based on his nature. We also see something very interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This passage was read earlier, but I I think we miss a major point here. Paul classifies the way God has arranged the body in 1 Corinthians 12. Does he say this is just the first century church? Does he say this is just for that moment? No, this is what he says. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets. You say, well, that was just the foundational apostles and prophets in the New Testament. Okay, we'll move on. Now what does he say? Third, teachers. Ah, that's good, because we still have teachers today. That's for today, right? Then miracles. Whoa, whoa, hang on. That's not for today. See, that that stopped. We still have teachers, but according to the non-gifts continuance argument, that that stopped. We have a problem, though, because Paul says third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing. No, those aren't for today. Miracles and gifts of healing aren't for today, you see. It's teachers, they're for today. Okay, helping, administrating, that's good. So we have helps, we administer, we have teaching, helping, administrating today. That's for today. But hang on, then Paul says, and various kinds of tongues. So it's last on the list. It's part of the list, and it's enough for Paul to mention. 
So there's no possible way that you, this is like saying you have a, a functioning human being, but without a heart, without two legs, without half the brain, without eyes. No, no, you can't just dissect the thing like this. So this is the way he put it in the Mahdi, this, to this moment. Teachers, those with gifts of healing, miracles, administrators, helpers, those who speak in tongues. That's the way God put it in the body. You can't rip it apart. And, and, and how about this? Romans 12. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we though many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. He didn't say it's going to stop. By the way, this is different than everything else on the rest of the list. This is a revelatory gift. No, no, no. And this is his definitive doctrinal book, Romans. So he's just laying it out, yeah. Some prophecy, same words that are used elsewhere in the New Testament for the gift of prophecy. And he says this, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes to generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. There you go. Prophecy is just as normal to be seen in the body as, as giving, as serving. And if you say, well, that has a different meaning there, well, who changed that? Who imported that meaning? He's writing to people that know about prophecy and function in it. And remember, the purpose of the gifts is to glorify the risen Jesus, to demonstrate the goodness and power of God to God's people and to the world. So Acts 4, when the believers are being persecuted, they pray. And this is how the apostles pray. Acts 4, verses 29 and 30. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Why was that acceptable for them to pray, but it's not acceptable for us to pray? Where does the Bible even give us a hint that what he was doing there was going to stop? Look, at the end of the book of Acts, Paul's on an island, and everyone that comes to him is healed on the island. There's no hint that this is suddenly going to stop or just fade away or cease. And again, historically, we know that's not the case. So how come this is a good prayer to pray at that time, but it's not a good prayer for us to pray? Why is it that the gifts had a certain Jesus-glorifying function that touched and transformed many lives in the early church, and that function now ceases somehow? And where is there even the slightest hint that when we have the whole Bible or something, that healing won't matter anymore, or that prophecy won't matter anymore, or that tongues won't be a valuable way of communing with God. As Paul says, you speak mysteries in your spirit to God and you edify yourself. There's not a hint of it. So I agree with New Testament scholar Thomas Schreiner when he says, nowhere does the New Testament clearly teach that supernatural gifts have ceased. But I'd go a step further. I would say it clearly, emphatically, definitively says that they will continue until Jesus returns. That's one. And two, we are called on by God to pursue these zealously, earnestly, because they are for the glory of God. And this should be part of our normal church practice by directive of the Lord in Scripture. Unless you can give me something definitive, clear, that contradicts this, that overrides this, that says it is no longer for today, I'll stay with the clear testimony of Scripture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for those uh, opening remarks. And so now we will move into a time of rebuttal. And each of the uh, debaters will have 12 minutes to uh, rebut the uh, other uh, debaters' remarks. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Zacharias, immediately followed by Dr. Brown. This is standard fare from Michael. Uh, I've watched him online. He utilizes this three-pronged approach with the nature of the kingdom in the Gospels, healing from James 5, and then, of course, you know, bits and pieces from the uh, epistles about the gifts. Uh, number one, the kingdom is irrelevant because the Gospels are pre-ascension. We're talking about charismatic gifts. There were no charismatic gifts. The Spirit had not even yet been given, according to John, chapter 7. So anything he brings up about what was going on while Jesus was here and saying that we have to do the same things 
is to denigrate the uniqueness of Jesus and his appointed apostles that our foundation, both in Ephesians 2.20 and also when you see the gates and the foundation of Revelation 21. Okay, the names of those apostles are on those foundations. They are special. They are special, selected by Jesus himself, and they are unique. They are not something that we can take on. There are no apostles today. So James is also not about the spiritual gifts. And if there were healings, then why didn't they call the healer? Why is it that the elders have to come? And when the elders do come, hold on a minute, let's check them. Let's check them for their qualifications. Where in the pastoral epistles does it say that you have to be able to heal to be an elder? It doesn't. Oh, does it say it somewhere else in the pastoral epistles? No, not even in the qualifications and nowhere else. So these things are irrelevant. They are tricks. The idea of use of power, okay, that this is power and this is power and this is power. If you just keep using the word power, that is committing what is known as illegitimate totality transfer. You're just taking the meaning of a term in one context and applying that same meaning in a different context. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us precisely what power. It's the power of the cross. It's the power of weakness. It's that kind of power. And so the favorite text that Michael uses, 1 Corinthians 4, when he says, well, here, it says it's not of word, but of power. That can't be utilized to just jettison scripture and have something that's powerful because it's the same kind of power that Paul speaks of in chapter 1 earlier. 1 through 4 is a unit. These things are all about the same matters. And Paul identifies that power there, as he does in the second letter to Corinthians, when he says that when I am weak, I am strong. Not when I am flashy and showy and, and have miracles and all these fancy things, but when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. He even prayed to the Lord three times, take this affliction from me, whatever it was, the thorn in the flesh. And Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, my power will be perfected in weakness, not in fanfare and showy. So, the other things. Let's look here. Desiring the gifts in chapter 14. 14, uh, right at the end of the chapter, right before he says to do things in order, there is an imperative there. I agree that the zelude there is an imperative, but you are missing the point because chapter 12, verse 31, is where Paul tells them that they are seeking the gifts. But when Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, desire the gifts. No, the spirituals. And this is the problem you have with using 1-7, again, as a kind of marker for the charismatic gifts when really what Paul is talking about in that context, in chapter 1, verse 7, is the witness of Christ. And they are full of the knowledge of Christ and the word of Christ and the message of the gospel. That message, that witness that has come to them, has come to them in fullness. That's the grace he begins with when he says grace to you. At the beginning of the text, it's the same idea. And it's the same idea when he gives them this information. And he says, you're not falling behind in any Gift. The word there is gift. It's not the word pneumaton, which the Corinthians were asking about. Is only one. Like I said before, it's only one of the terms. You have to understand that it means just God's gift. His gifts in plural, including all things. Now, is that necessary that they will stay until the second coming? Because in the next verse it says, while you wait... Well, while I wait for the bus, it might be raining, but that doesn't mean it's going to rain forever. To assume, to, to, to assume that that's what's going to happen until the coming of the Lord is displaced by what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians 13, he tells us 
or when the perfect comes. That word is not the word that he uses in chapter 11 for the second coming. It's not the word he uses in 1 7 for the second coming. And in chapter 15, when he speaks of the second coming, he uses again a different word. Why is it that Paul, who knows how to speak of the second coming in various ways, does not use that word in 1 Corinthians 13? I'll tell you why. Because he doesn't mean that. He means the complete, the complete revelatory process. And that complete revelatory process is when the canon is complete, when all of God's revelation is given. And by that time, now notice this, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, how does it end? It says, now remain faith, hope, love. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean faith, hope, love? What about the gifts? The gifts have long ceased. Now remain faith, hope, love. There's two stages. There are two stages. By the time you get to the eschaton, faith, hope, love will keep enduring. Even though he said only love endures, evidently faith, hope, and love endure until the end. Also, in 1 Corinthians 13, in this same text, Paul says, I put away childish things. If the result of that is me going to heaven... Where on earth does the Bible say I get to heaven by something that I do? By changing, by by becoming better, by increasing my stature somehow. I put away childish things is a metaphor. Just like the mirror is a metaphor. And when you look in a mirror, you don't see Jesus, you see yourself. And the perfect mirror of James 1, 25, 26 is this very word that comes to us in completion, and when we look in Scripture, it reads us. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. All right? It reveals me better than I know myself. I have the full Word of God, something not even the apostles had. They were still writing it. We have in our hands the complete Word of God. Now, if God is speaking to people today, then... If, if these prophecies are continuing, then we better make space in the back of our Bible, put in some appendices, and we better find the apostles who are speaking these words today and listen to them because they must be a word from God. And if they are, they are equivalent to Scripture. Now, if you say they're not, then you have a problem because that's what prophecy is. And to just isolate a few and say, well, these, these obviously have to, have to have ceased because it's sort of arbitrary, Is not the point. The point is God tells us that the prophecies are going to cease. He tells us that God is going to stop them in a very violent way. He uses the term katalieo, katalithesunde. That's God stopping them himself. It's not arbitrary. It's not something that, that, uh, you know, we just want to make up. It's the revelation of Scripture. Now, about the passage in 1 Corinthians 14, another thing. Um, this is a double imperative, all right? When he says, to seek the gifts and then forbid not, okay? This is, this is a double imperative of the same thing. The analogy here is when Jesus tells the disciples to let the little children come and forbid them not. Mi all right? Mi means forbid them not. But notice, this is a construction, a double imperative over the same issue. So when he says, you know, desire to speak or seek the, the prophesying and then forbid not, lalin in the Greek, forbid, forget not speaking, is the same as the prophesying and don't let tongues interpret in, in, in a, intercede and, and stop the prophesying. It's, it's, it's a parallel to what Jesus is saying when he says, Is that it? Oh, no. Three minutes. It's a parallel to when Jesus says, let the children come and forbid them not. Forbid them not. The same thing. It's one thing put in a positive and a negative. And exactly the same thing Paul is doing using that same construction with the migoliede. Okay? It's only found in a couple of places, and you see that construction. It's very clear. And in the original, that's what it means. It means seek and do not forbid to speak. Seek to prophesy and forbid not to speak, that is prophesying, with tongues. 
Don't let tongues get in the way of prophesying. Otherwise, if he, even, if he, even if he were to say, don't forbid tongues, tongues really is right at the bottom of the list again. Don't forbid it. It's not like he's enthusiastic about it, but that's not the right interpretation. The correct interpretation is that you are to seek for prophecy to be in your midst because this is wholesome. This is good. There's nothing there that suggests that prophecy will always be there. And even if the Thessalonians were not to despise prophecies, they weren't to despise them while they were being given. But when God would stop them, as he said he would violently stop them, then there's nothing to forbid, right? There's nothing to to interfere with because it's going to stop. That phenomenon, that revelatory process is superseded by the complete word of God. At the end of the day, this discussion about the gifts is about whether we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. That That is the real issue. If God is speaking to me outside of Scripture... If God is doing miraculous things through me, then God can speak to people through me with manifestations of power, manifestations of tongues and healing and all these things. Time. Thank you. I can sum up my rebuttal with one word. Wow. Maybe if we had several hours, I'd rebut everything in massive detail, but because the scriptures are sufficient and clear and unambiguous, we'll use the 12 minutes and demolish the wrong arguments we were presented with. It's interesting that Paul uses charismata in 1 Corinthians 12.4 with reference to tongues, healings, those kinds of things, and 12.31 The same thing in 1 Corinthians. But we're just told that when he uses the identical word, charismata in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, it doesn't actually mean that. But who told them that? Where'd they get the information? In order to believe Theodore, you have to believe that every major English translation in history, or at least from King James to today, is wrong. I'm telling you, read any translation you want. Get 100 different translations, they'll all verify me. That's a little scary when one of your biggest points has to say all English translations are wrong and nobody got it right until right here. That's dangerous. That would concern anyone. Not only so, the idea that knowledge in 1 Corinthians 13.8 is referring to word of knowledge or revelatory knowledge, just show me where Paul uses that same word, knowledge, in 1 Corinthians. In that term, I'll consider it. But in and of itself, no, doesn't work. Sorry. Theodore claims Paul cannot tell us to be zealous for spiritual gifts when God sovereignly gives as he pleases. He looks at hearts. For example, we, we could be Calvinists. I'm not. We could be Calvinists and say God chooses whom he wants, but people are commanded to believe. There's zero contradiction. And the reason he has to build the case with zero contradiction and say the verse is being mistranslated is because he has no scriptural foundation on which to stand. The plain text of scripture is explicitly against him. Uh, We'll get back to 1 Corinthians 13 in a moment, but some of the comments I just heard in the rebuttal are shocking. The kingdom is irrelevant. What Jesus did before the ascension is irrelevant. It's degrading Jesus to say that Jesus is still doing those things today. It's degrading Jesus to say that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's degrading Jesus to say that the same Jesus who healed in his love and mercy and set captives free then is doing it today. That's degrading. No, that is glorifying him. That's why hundreds of millions of people around the world are glorifying the name of Jesus and believing the written word because of the work of the risen Savior. And to downgrade the gifts, I never thought I'd hear that. When you talk about Paul being used in miracles and to say that's showy, that's fanfare, as if he's some corrupt TV preacher, denigrating the gifts that the word of God so highly prizes that were signs of the ascended spirit? And not only so, I referenced 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. I didn't, I didn't quote 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not a matter of word only, but of power. We could debate the meaning there. I quoted 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, where Paul says, when I was with you, my speech and preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and dunamis, power, spirit and power, hand in hand, all over, all over the New Testament. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So by preaching Christ crucified, that now 
Christ in his weakness, now God is glorified through the outpouring of his spirit. Does it exalt the person? No, it exalts God. It is, look, if I get up a great debate and people say, you persuaded me, you could talk about me. When the sick are healed through me, you say, God is alive. God is alive. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, when the gift of prophecy is released, as a result, people fall on their faces and glorify God. They don't glorify you, it's the opposite. When it's my great preaching and my great teaching and my great exposition and my great knowledge, people look to you and praise you. When it's God working miracles, they fall on their face and worship the one true and living God. Not only so, Paul indicates that the kingdom of God, we were told that's irrelevant, is not in word but in power. We can debate the meaning of power there, as I said, but the fact of the matter is he speaks of the ongoing work of the kingdom of God. To say it's irrelevant, what Jesus did before is irrelevant for argument. When Jesus himself tells us if we believe in him that we will do the same works by his power, I take his words seriously. God forbid that I make them irrelevant or make the kingdom irrelevant. Keep going, run a roll. If, if we raise the question of prophecy continues, then prophecy is equivalent to scripture. What happened to all the prophecies in the New Testament church that are not recorded? Right. Certainly the gift of prophecy was prevalent. Certainly Paul, uh, Peter says it's gonna be poured out on all flesh, your sons and daughters were prophesied. If any prophecy was equivalent to scripture, what about all the words of ancient prophets that are not recorded? Look, Paul the apostle wrote letters, but not all of them were scripture. Yet they were words from an apostle. We know he had other letters that we don't have today, like the, the letter to the Laodiceans. So there was prophecy, but it was not, scripture stands alone. Scripture alone is the word of God. We bow down to scripture, it is eternal, unchangeable for all people. Prophecies are words spoken that must be tested. And at most can be a word from the Lord in a given situation. So there are many prophecies in the New Testament days that were not written down. And if you want to go through church history, just go in the second and the third century where you hear the church leaders talking about prophecies. Well, where were they written? Why weren't they written down? Because they weren't scripture. It was understood they weren't scripture. And what's utterly remarkable as this idea of 1 Corinthians 13 is speaking of the canon being closed, this interpretation is almost unknown through church history. In fact, uh, during the cross-examination, you'd have time to prepare for this, sir. I'd be curious to know the, the major early church leaders, especially before the canon was complete, who understood that's what Paul was saying and knew at a certain point in time when we, get the, we finally agree on the holy books and which is which, that, that then it's fixed. And how is it that after the fixing and closing of the canon that Augustine is still talking about miracles and healings and things like that? As for James, the fifth chapter, not being relevant, okay, if you say that on a regular basis the elders are praying in faith for the sick to be healed and all your churches, Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, Pentecostal churches, and that's not part of our debate, fine. That's, I'll, work, I'll, I'll live with that if the sick are being healed in Jesus' name and that is not a problem uh, for you today, great. But I, I think that challenges many because it would seem that if God is still healing that we can expect these other things to happen. It is utterly ludicrous. It is illogical. It is theologically unsound. It is without any scriptural support to say if God heals the sick through you, that takes away from the sufficiency of scripture. That's like saying if, God, if you are used by God to lead someone to the Lord, that takes away from the sufficiency of Scripture. That's like saying if you're kind to your child and it helps your child find the love of God, that's taking away from the sufficiency of Scripture. To say we have another book, another holy book, authoritative utterances that are the Word of God and that are equal to Scripture, that takes away from sufficiency of Scripture. Or to say God does not give us adequate revelation of who Jesus is or the way of salvation, that takes away from the authority of Scripture. But to say God healing the sick in Jesus' name to confirm the written word takes away from the sufficiency of Scripture is, as I said, illogical and theologically unsound. Also, I mean no insult here, but it was painful to listen to the discussion of 1 Corinthians 14, 39, and to say it doesn't mean what all your translations say. So... First, there's the agreement, there's the exhortation to earnestly pursue the gifts. So here, put yourself in my shoes. I come to faith in 1971. I was a heroin shooting, LSD using, long-haired hippie rock drummer. Jewish kid, no background in church, church history. I'm in a church where they say they speak in tongues, where there's prophecy, where there's healing of the sick, all right? 
Some other people say those things ceased. Well, I take out my Bible, and it says, it says, right after the 1 Corinthians 13 discussion, it says, earnestly pursue the gifts. Earnestly pursue these spiritual things. Which spiritual things? He's been talking about. There's no ambiguity. The very things he's been talking about using that same word, spirituals, in 1 Corinthians 12. Earnestly pursue them, especially prophecy. So I'm going to do that. Why? Because God's word tells me to. And I'm not going to forbid speaking in tongues. So if there's tongues and it seems to be legitimate or we're going to test to see if it's legitimate, the one thing I know, don't forbid based on some reason it's not for today or whatever. So I'm just going to go by what Scripture says and to try to parse it differently and, and say all the other translations are wrong. And Again, it's a very precarious point. It's, it's one thing to have a little nuance of a point here and there that we differ on and, and, and it's, it's secondary or tertiary, where I'm telling you you have to better understand the Hebrew, read my doctoral dissertation on Israel's divine healer and, and the meaning of the Hebrew, and, and there's a nuance there. It's, it's a totally other thing when we're talking about a major issue and a major point. The fact of the matter is, books have been written which have demonstrated the gifts in one form or another ongoing through history. But either way, history is not our issue. The issue is scripture. So, Acts, the second chapter, remember this was supposed to be a rebuttal of my position. Acts, the second chapter, was not even touched on, right? The outpouring of the Spirit, and that included tongues, miracles, and the like. The outpouring of the Spirit is on whom? All flesh for all time. What? During the last days. During the la are we in the last days? Yes. Has Jesus returned yet? No. Therefore, Scripture, God's Word, I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, so Scripture, it tells me explicitly it is continuing. Not only so, the idea of miracles coming through others is denigrating the apostles. No, the apostles are the apostles. That's done. And yeah, they're the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. That's done. That's fixed. There are no apostles like those apostles ever since. We totally agree. No argument. But wasn't it Stephen who was anointed and Philip, and didn't they work miracles? Weren't they sick healed through them? Weren't, didn't Philip have daughters who, were pro, who prophesied? How does that take away from the uniqueness of the apostles? And wouldn't the apostles be thrilled to see that the same spirit that was upon them is upon others? And wasn't that the prayer of Moses, that it wouldn't just be him or 70 elders who prophesied, but rather that all God's people could prophesy? By God's grace, we are swimming in an ocean of the goodness and grace of God manifest in the outpouring of his spirit. So many hundreds of millions around the world being gloriously converted and brought to believe in the authority of Scripture and the Lordship of Jesus because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'll stay with the simple, plain meaning of Scripture. I will not disobey God. I will continue to earnestly desire the best gifts. I will continue to earnestly desire prophecy. I will not forbid tongues. I will pray for the sick in faith just like the Word of God says. It's real simple to me. I believe it because the Bible tells me so. Thank you. Okay, we will now start with the uh, time of cross-examination. And just as a reminder of the rules, each uh, debater will have 15 minutes to conduct the cross-examination of the other debater. And for responses, gentlemen, you have two minutes for your responses. And so we will begin with, uh, with Dr. Brown, I believe it was agreed upon. Uh, you'll begin with your cross-examination of Dr. Zachariatis. Sir, on you. Yes, sir. So uh, I, I gave you a number of explicit texts when you referenced at the end yourself where we are called on to pursue spiritual gifts or 1 Thessalonians 5 where Paul says don't despise prophecy, etc. Can you give me any explicit texts that say we should not do these things today? Well, again, um, I believe that God told us that the prophecies will end, and he will stop them. So you say that that's going to be until the end. I don't believe that's what's borne out by the exegesis of 1 Corinthians 13. I think that's an imposition on the text. He's not talking about the end of time. He's not talking about the parousia. He's not talking about the second coming or heaven or perfection in the afterlife or death. He's not talking about any of those things. He's talking about a completed revelatory process. All right, but to repeat my question, is there an explicit text? Yes. Because I, I read that said, do not, uh, I read it says, do not uh, forbid tongues, okay? 
and I don't do, think that's the right reading of that. Or, text. Or, let's put that aside then. Earnestly pursue these things, especially prophecy. Can you give me a text that says he's don't saying, do that? He's saying earnestly desire the spiritual. In First Corinthians twelve, he uses their word because that's what they're doing, what they think is best. In First Corinthians chapter fourteen, in that verse, verse thirty nine, he's not saying the same thing as he was saying there. But he's it's, saying it's, it's it's different, and so you can't equate them. Well, well uh, again, that's your interpretation. I am, saying, that, I am that he, saying that desiring prophecy is what Paul was urging them to do. Oh, does he ever urge me not to? Well, no. I mean, he, he, he doesn't say, don't desire prophecy. Okay, so he does say desire it, and he never says, don't desire it. <laughs> okay, you, 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 you're trying to trick me. No, no, I'm trying to go with the word. No, 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 no. You, wh- uh, sir, I if, would not try to trick if you. If prophecies are going to cease when the complete revelation comes, then you're no longer going to seek them because they're not evident. They're not coming. They're not there. You don't seek what's not there or what God doesn't intend. It's God that intends for them to stop. All right, so you agree he never says don't seek them. He does say seek them. He never says don't seek them. Yeah, well, I, 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 I want to say yes, but with reservation. Oh, okay. Because what you're, what you're implying with that is that they must continue in the same fashion up until the coming of Christ. Well, I don't believe that's borne out by the text. Okay, so we'll come back to 1 Corinthians in a moment, but we're all clear on that. He does explicitly say seek. He never explicitly says don't seek. All right, second thing, Acts, the second chapter, it says that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is on all flesh, so your sons and daughters will prophesy, not just apostles, etc. And it is in this period of the last days, it's words that Paul inserts that are not in the Septuagint or in the Hebrew, and then in Acts 2.39, it says, This promise of the Spirit is for you, your children, all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So when did that change? Well, the, the, the question is not when it changes. The question is understanding its nature. You see, this is part of redemptive history. Pentecost is not a repeatable event. Pentecost is part of the first coming of Christ. So you can't say, oh, I have to have a Pentecost in my life. I have to get baptized by the Spirit. I have to speak in tongues. I have to do these things. That's not how to read it. You have to read it in its redemptive historical nature. It's a one-time thing. It is the establishing of this period, the church, the foundational period of the church. That doesn't mean that that's going to happen forever after this. This is something that is unique and unrepeatable. Pentecost is not something you have whenever you want to. It's not the order of salvation. It's redemptive historical. And if you don't see that, that's part of the problem. You want everything that the apostles had to experience the same thing. Well, why don't you sell your property and bring it to the apostles? Oh, wait, there are no apostles. Well, let's scratch that. You agreed. Well, go sell your property and give me some of that. That's what it says there. They didn't keep their things. They sold them. They had communal fellowship. Why don't we do that? Why do you pick and choose what you want? Yeah, so it's either, it's either you're going to take it all or you don't take it all because it's redemptively historical in its significance. It's not ongoing. It's not something that must repeat in everyone's life. Right, so to, to clarify, yes. I'll, I'll bypass the fact that you brought in a totally irrelevant example from Acts 4, which is not a command, an ongoing command. But to reiterate, it says this is for the last days. That's the period we're in now. That's one. Two, it was the pattern throughout the book of Acts that people received the Spirit, people spoke in tongues, people prophesied, the sick were healed, and not just the apostles. So that is something that is given a time frame, the last days. It doesn't yes. just say then. It says the last days. That's one. Two, it is the pattern in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. Three, it's the pattern we're called on to follow in the epistles. So are, are we still in the last days? The, the, the question is, you still don't understand the nature of Acts. And yes, indeed, songs are mentioned three times in Acts. Chapter 2, chapter uh, Ten. 10, and chapter 19. Okay, Every time Jews are present, when Paul talks about tongues, he says they are a sign to the Jews. Well, a sign from what? Go back and look at Isaiah 28, verse 11, when he tells them, I'm going to speak to you with stammering lips, tongues of, uh, and back then it would have been Sennacherib, right? 701, the invasion of the Assyrians. It was the Assyrian language. Not gobbledygook, not what you see today, but that, again, maybe is irrelevant. But here, the, the book of Acts tells us that this was what happened when the apostles came. 
When the apostles came, they had to go to the Samaritans and put their hands on them. Otherwise, they wouldn't receive the Spirit. And when John the Baptist's disciples, when he asked them, do, do you know about the, the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't even know about it. Wait a minute. John's whole ministry was, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? If they're John's disciples, they don't know. No, he was talking about something specific, something unique. And they didn't get it. And he had to rebaptize them, if you will, because they didn't know the truth. Every time you see the miraculous in Acts, it's always about the propagation of the word. You see, when the word is what is glorified, the word is what is magnified. All right, you can't deny that. When they're filled with the spirit, they speak the word boldly. Okay, so when the word is glorified even in Acts 13, 48, and you see this again, the, the explosion of the word is what is major in Acts and that revelatory process, as Paul would write in the letter to the Corinthians, would soon end. And when it does, from that point on, you have faith, hope, love. Well, the other things don't remain. What remains, Paul says, is faith, hope, love. You've got to exegete that whole right. passage okay, so to time. understand it. Yeah, all right. So just back, back to the, the question. You acknowledge we're in the last days, but you claim that tongues... We're only assigned for the Jews. So, it was this, so when Paul asked the Ephesian believers in Acts 19, did you receive the Spirit when you believed, how was that a sign for him? And when they prophesy, how is that a, a sign for him? Part one of the question. Part two, there's still Jews in the world today. And I give you verifiable examples of tongues as foreign languages spoken supernaturally, prophecies verifiable. So... On what basis, then? I don't, I don't, the, the experiences don't prove anything. Well, you said the gobbly, you, you, you gave a disparaging yeah, okay. thing, yeah, 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 which yeah. would okay. be better right. passed by. I'll give okay. you that one. All right, so all right. Let, let's, let's, let's move on, then, to, to a different question. Um, just for clarity, you mentioned James 5, and it doesn't call for the elders to be healers or have faith for healing, but this is something that we're called on to do on a regular basis. If someone is sick, they should call for the elders. There's an expectation when they're anointed with oil and prayed for that there will be healing, so is this something that you believe every church should be practicing in accordance with James chapter 5, that we should all be regularly praying for the sick and that elders should be people capable of praying in faith for the sick to be healed? That doesn't have anything to do with the charismatic gifts. You sure? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there could be no one with a gift of healing, or perhaps there were elders with gifts of healing. That, Where is the that, mention of the charismatic gift of healing in James? It's, it's not, but it's expected that they can pray in faith for healing. That's it doesn't not say same, that they're not That's not the same as the gift. That's, I didn't deny that God can heal, and I don't deny that God can heal in answer to prayer. I believe God continues to be sovereign, and he can answer prayer. He can send the person to the medical doctor, and he can heal him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it's not, a, 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 how did Richard Balcom put it? It's like a spiritual mechanism where you just pray, and the result happens. It's not like that. That's not how it works. All right, okay, but just to be, for the record... If, and if you don't want to answer this, that's fine. Do you believe that this should be a regular practice that we pray for, that people who are sick call the elders for prayer for, for healing and that we should be able to pray in faith for their healing? That, that should be part I of our believe, regular practice. I believe that, number one, we have to designate what the kind of sickness is because it's possible that it's physical. It's possible also that it's not physical. And so it could be spiritual and they're not able to pray because of the condition they're in. And if that's the case, then, yeah, maybe... And if they have sinned, it says, they, they will be forgiven. Now, I, I don't know what the connection with sin and sickness is. I know that sometimes in the New Testament, that's assumed, sometimes wrongly. Sometimes we see the connection between sickness and, you know, sin, like 1 Corinthians. And so, you know, I can't, I can't say in James it's always that. I don't know. But we have to be careful how we apply. And when we're discussing spiritual gifts... These spiritual gifts are not required of elders. Mm -hmm. The gift of healing is not required. The gift of tongues is not required. None of these charismatic gifts are required of elders. So to be an elder in the church is not necessary that you be a healer. So they don't have the gift of healing, and that's irrelevant to the question of the charismatic gifts. Okay, so... As fine, I just had wanted to know your policy, that whether we should follow that, and just want to be clear on that. All right, so you, uh, and again, in cross-examination, the goal is not for me to respond to each point, but to go on with my question. So you stated that if 
uh, there were prophecies that we'd have to add to the Bible, and yet there were plenty of prophecies not recorded in the New Testament with many people prophesying. We have reference to people being prophets and their words are not recorded. So why is it different then or through church history where there are reference to prophecies? That's part one of the question. Part two, how is it taking away from the sufficiency of Scripture if God heals a sick person through you? All right, let, well, the second point first. Uh, you know, it, it's a loaded question. What I'm suggesting is the miraculous gifts, not the healing. Healing in James 5 is irrelevant, so don't bring that back up. So in terms of whether, you know, prophecy is equal to Scripture, if it is not, then, then you have a problem with definition because that's the definition of it, going back to the Old Testament. The prophet speaks the Word of God. So it is the Word of God, not a mixture of error, not things that might be true, might not be true, and the predictions have to come to pass. Otherwise, they're not the Word of God. So you find that in Deuteronomy. That's very, very clear. So to say, well, well, well it's, it's not the same level of Scripture, but it's still the Word of God, that's, that doesn't compute. So either it is or it isn't. What's going on is that we're equivocating so that we can have the prophecy, but then we say, well, it's not always going to be 100% accurate, and the prophet might make a mistake, and, you know, this kind of thing. I don't think that's the correct definition of prophecy. Prophecy, by definition, is the one who is sent by God and speaks the word of God. So that means that there are tons of scriptures not recorded. No, God has given us everything that we need. But, but, but according could he to have you, added more? He could have added more if he wanted. All right, so in other words, there are tons of prophecies that were the word of God when spoken, but just not recorded. Maybe, yes. So why can't it be the same today? Because the people that are claiming that today are not speaking the word of God. That, I mean, they've, they've but, said things that don't come to pass. I mean, they've uh, so, been so it's, to it's, be the, false. it's the nature. Uh, enough said. That was a telling, a telling pause there. Enough said. Okay, I've got time for, pause. <laughs> for, for, one last, for one last question. All right. Uh, so based on 1 Corinthians 13, I understand that you now have perfect knowledge. You know the Lord the way he knows you, and you have a face-to-face -face relationship with him, correct? No, I didn't say that. I said the face-to-face -face is not a reference to heaven because the text doesn't bear it out. The illustration is figurative. And so the first part of the illustration is figurative. The latter part has to be figurative. And so this is a reference to, to you know this better than anyone here. This is a reference to Moses. Go to chapter 12, go to chapter 7 in Numbers, go to Exodus 33. You know what I'm talking about. You know the Old Testament better than anyone here. Mm -hmm. All right? So you know this is a reference to Moses. And he's going on about the... In I have to One stop minute. Him. One oh. minute. You got it. He's talking about the revelation that he gives to Moses that he didn't give to the others. The others might have had a little bit of the Word of God, but Moses got the whole Pentateuch. That's the point. And that was considered like a canon. Canon within the canon. And also when they had all the books of the Old Testament. And again, you know, they, and, uh, they understood the notion of a closed canon. So this is something Jesus brings up too. So it's not irrelevant to the text. It's not something that is so out of whack. This is the actual meaning of the passage. The closing of a revelatory process is not foreign to this text. I'm not claiming that I have knowledge. I am claiming that I have the word of God that is perfect. And that is the complete revelation. And the knowledge I have through scripture is that that the scripture reads me. That's the meaning. That I know as I am known, I know the word of God. Time, gentlemen. Okay, so we'll go ahead and, uh, and shift to Dr. Zachariatis and your cross-examination of Dr. Brown. And just let me remind you all to please afford uh, the recipient of the question uh, time to answer Please, so uh, on you, Dr. Zacharias. Okay. Now, you, you, you want to pick and choose from Max. So in chapter 4, it's not relevant then, but all the other things that happen in Acts have to happen. Okay, so Acts chapter 4 is not a command that we're supposed to sell all the possessions and lay them at the apostles' feet. Nonetheless, plenty of believers to this day, friends, colleagues of mine, sell what they have, give the money to the poor, go on the mission field, I go back to what Jesus says, calling us to do so. But Acts 2 is talking about what God is doing and what he will do 
in the last days, and this will continue, and it is on all flesh, and it's right through Acts and right through presupposed in the letters, and we're told to pursue these things to this day, whereas the other is giving history. So one thing is what God did and what God will continue to do, and the other is a historical account of something that happened. Do I want to do what Ananias and Sapphira did? You know, do I, you know so do I want to have a split because Paul and Barnabas did? So there, there, are, there are things that are historical accounts, and there are other things that are commands, and other things that speak of wh- what God is doing and will continue to do. Okay. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll take that. That's fine. So show me from um, 1 Corinthians 13, then, why you believe that this is about the eschaton. Mm-hmm. Is it just the face-to-face and the, the word perfect? Yes, so uh, a great question. Why do I believe 1 Corinthians 13 is speaking of the eschaton or the state in which we'll exist after Jesus returns? Uh, Number one, if we say that it goes back to Moses, Numbers 12, that he spoke to the Lord face to face as a man speaks with his friend, Exodus 33, the same thing, that uh, I I don't know that the whole body has that relationship with God or that you do, that, that we just talk back and forth, like we're talking back and forth now, that that's the same way it is with, with us and, and the Lord. I don't know that to be normative for the whole body, and yet it's, it says that'll be the case. And certainly the case with Moses has nothing to do with a, a, a receiving a completed canon. That's certainly not what's referenced in Exodus 33 or Numbers 12. But specifically, I just look at this. Now we see but a poor reflections in a mirror, then we'll see face to face. So unless we all have that same experience that Moses had talking literally face to face with God and says he saw the form, the tunah of the Lord, then we we don't have that experience yet. Now I know in part, he doesn't say then I will have the full information. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So as God fully knows us, we by the opening of our eyes and becoming like Jesus will, will know him in this way. So this is not the case yet, that's number one. And number two, although I failed to ask, so it's too late for it now, uh, this idea that this is the completion of the canon I find to be almost unknown in church history until the last century plus. So just the plain sense of the words emphatically is speaking of something that we are still waiting for and longing for. Okay, so you believe that that the uh, metaphor is figurative in one sense and then literal in the other? No. I, I, I take it metaphorically both or literally both. If you can help me see where I'm not okay. doing that, please do. Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering about, because you're talking about, like, um, it says the mirror, right? Uh, when the perfect comes, we're, we're talking about the same thing. And it says that we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. If the, dark, the, the glass darkly is, is figurative, then why does the face-to-face have to be literal? It doesn't have to be literal. It has to be corresponding. For example, the fact that we're having a debate here, I, I trust that you're a very serious student of the word. I trust you're very sincere. I, I don't know you well, but listening to you tonight, I thought this man's very serious about what he believes and is devoted. You pastor a church. Uh, I don't know what you think of me, but God knows I'm, I'm trying to please him and honor him these last 46 years. And yet here we are having a debate uh, uh, we could debate Calvinism. We could debate, we could debate the gifts of the Spirit. We could, you could go around the room here and some would believe in infant baptism, some would believe in believer baptism, and on and on and on. That's because we still aren't there yet. We still are in that place of perfect knowledge. Again, not that I'll have a perfect Bible, but rather I will know even as I'm fully known. So to me, that's interpreting. So whether the face-to-face is that's when I literally see him the same way, or whether it means that's when there's perfect revelation, no need for faith, no trials, no tests. It's not through a, through a glass dark. Look, the fact so many people struggle with the problem of suffering. Where was God during this time? And we say, look, we quote this. Right now, we only see us through a glass darkly. We understand the application just quite naturally. That's where we are yet. I'm, assu- I'm sure in the, in the world to come, we're both grace to be with the Lord forever. We won't be having this debate at that time. All right, how do you account for the three that remain in verse 13? This is noted by many, many scholars as a very difficult problem for your view. Right, well, I see the word now as, as being a key word because at that moment, Paul himself said he spoke in tongues more than any of the Corinthians. 
Paul himself encouraged the seeking of prophecy. We all agree that in Paul's day, these things were relevant and ongoing. So when he says now, he doesn't say at that time, right? Now I know in part, and now these three remain, okay? So faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. He's simply making a point. He's not speaking about anything ceasing here because it wasn't ceasing at that point. Now no. is, is not a problem at all okay. for, for me. I, uh, I'll, I'll stop in a second so you can jump in on my time. But I don't see now as saying now there's no tongues, now there's no prophecy. If you want to say in the future, but he doesn't. He said now these three remain faith, hope, and, and, and love. So this is simply emphasizing no matter what. And faith was also one of the gifts, gift of faith, right? These things continue, but more important than anything is love. That's all. It's just making that point. More important than anything is love. So you've got to operate in the gifts based on love. That's the whole point. And as you say, it's definitely part of the context. So wh why, why, why only those three remain? What, what happened to prophecy, tongues, and, and knowledge? Well, first, he does say now, now I know in part, then I shall know fully. So at That's that... That's then, not, not now. Now endure only faith, hope, love. Where right. are the gifts? The gifts are gone. Where, I didn't have to insert a word to make the point, though. Where does he say only? Does he say the others don't remain? No, he says that these are the things that remain. Okay, so he's saying that tongues was not present at that time. Well, he's saying that there's going to be a time when these endure, but the others are not there. That's the point, the two stages. But it's not now. He said now. Now. Tongues was present then. Prophecy was, this presents no problem for me, it presents okay. a problem for you. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. That's fine. That's okay. It's, it's a question. You answered it. That's fine. All right. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left? About four minutes. Four, four and a half minutes. minutes. Okay. How do you account for passages that tell us things like um, when, when, when Jesus told the story of the man the rich man and Lazarus, and then the rich man obviously wanted his brothers to be saved, and so he said, send back Lazarus so he can go. And what did Jesus tell him? He said, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe them, they won't believe even if someone was raised from the dead. And the interesting thing along with that, because there was an actual Lazarus who was raised from the dead, and rather than believing, the people wanted to kill him because he was raised from the dead in John 11. So how does that fit with the theory that you propose that these miraculous things need to be there? Um, and I don't know if it's appropriate to quote your book or not, but in your book you say that, you know, going to, to some jungle out in the middle of nowhere, what's the point of taking a Bible if I don't have the miraculous? So Jesus seems to say if they don't listen to the Bible, even the miraculous is not going to help them. But you say the Bible's not enough. We need the miraculous. All right, so thank you. A great question. Number one, I never say the Bible's not enough. My point is, if you go to a people and they hold up the Quran, we have a holy book, and we say, we have a holy book. And it was confirmed by miracles. Saying that in itself is, is not going to do it. Of course the word of God is sufficient. And people get saved through hearing scripture, through scripture being opened up to them. People have never seen a miracle, never seen a sick person healed never spoke in tongues, they come to faith, praise God. The word of God is powerful and effectual. The, 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 the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. But what's interesting, though, is that your argument would negate the miraculous ministry of Jesus because he constantly said, if you don't believe me, believe based on the miracles. It would also contradict the miraculous outpouring in Acts, which is constantly used, like Peter says after the healing in Acts 3. Look, this is proof that Jesus is risen. And, and that's why they say in Acts 5, we're witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit. He testifies to these things. And it's all for the exaltation of the word of God and the glorification of Jesus. But we might even say, well, look, the resurrection of Jesus wasn't sufficient to convince them because it wasn't just Lazarus who rose, but Jesus who rose, and people still didn't believe. So yes, there are plenty of people that hear the scriptures preached and don't believe. And these same people see miracles and they don't believe. But many others, when miracles are done to draw attention to who Jesus is, that's part of God's extension of his love and mercy, opening hearts and minds and drawing people to the scriptures. So what's remarkable is that some of the most devoted people to the authority of scripture worldwide and have some of the highest views of scripture are those who believe that God's still working miracles to this day. 
there are uh, plenty of abuses. I, my most recent book, Playing with Holy Fire, deals with them, just as there are abuses in, in every group that we have. I take ownership for the abuses in my group. But just like Paul never denied the reality of the work of the Spirit among the Corinthians because of the abuses, I don't deny the reality of the Spirit's work today because of the very serious abuses that exist. Okay. So it's the same with, uh, uh, is that it, out of time? Okay. Oh, we have time? I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so we have the signs. Jesus, Jesus uh, did many, many things, right? And the signs were there to lead people to faith, right? And, and sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they brought lots of people, but for the wrong reasons. Now, in John particularly, it says that Jesus did many, many other things, but that these things are written that you may believe. It doesn't say these things are to be replicated so people will believe. It's about the testimony of the scriptures themselves. It's not about authenticating the word anymore. It was at a time when piecemeal revelation was going on, and that was what was happening during Acts. The word was being verified, like Jesus said in Mark 16. I know you don't accept that one. No, For the sake I'm, I'm of argument, I, I'm good I, I accept it. Yeah, you should. <laughs> but I, I accept it, but I don't have a problem with it because I think it's, it's fulfilled in the lives of the apostles, particularly in Paul. So, you know, he was bitten with the snake and all this on Malta. So here you have it. I think that, you know, the signs verified the word of God according to Jesus for then. But once the complete revelation comes, this is the meaning of Jesus when he says, look, they have Moses and the prophets. That's the point, isn't it? Isn't that the point? Isn't the point that Jesus says, look, these things were, were written, or John says about Jesus, that these things were written that you may believe? Not these things will be replicated. Not these things will be copied or mimicked or ongoing. It says these things have been written. Not all the ones that happen, but these things. These things that have been written are designed to lead you to the faith. Yeah. which is in Christ. So you've got a wonderful circle, you just didn't complete it. So this is written, so I believe. When I read it, it tells me, expect this for today. It tells me Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It tells me that John 14, 12 is in process, etc. So it tells me to believe these things. So based on what's written, yes, I believe it's for today. Was that, was that the last one? Or do Good we have time. time? Okay. In John 15, all right, 15, Wait, hang, hang on, I got two minutes to answer. I was supposed to get two minutes to answer a question. Yes, uh, I and thought you, you were done. And you gave me the gavel about 10 seconds in. The gavel was two, two minutes left in the overall questioning time. Ah. So, yeah, you still had time to answer. He's I'm got two sorry. minutes. He's got two minutes left to ask questions. Well, tell you what, then back to you. You answered go, that question. Go ahead. I, I would have answered more next, fully, but go ahead. the next one? Go, go for it. add something? No, 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 no. Okay, in we're John good. 15, uh, this is a relevant text because all of, all of this part of John uh, is where he promises the Spirit, right? We, we know that. This is one of those texts. And, of course, you, you allude to uh, verse 12 in chapter 14 about those who believe these things will be done. Well, of course, we know that um, the Spirit will be given. And in John 15, right at the end of the chapter, it says, in, in the context of receiving the Spirit, the comfort is coming, it says, and ye shall also bear witness... Because you have been with me from the beginning. This is unique to the apostles. And when you find in Acts, this same thing is what was promised them. So wh why don't you accept that, that this uniqueness of the apostles, why do you try to universalize everything that happened to them? Jesus says the very reason that this is happening mm -hmm. is because you were with me from the beginning. Right. So How I'm does not, that apply to you and me? Does right. It? Number one, I'm not trying to be one of the apostles. I'm not trying to universalize. Number two, I am believing what Jesus said, that whoever believes in him will do the same works that he did. Number three, I noticed that in the book of Acts, the second chapter, the outpouring is not just on the apostles, but on sons and daughters and on all flesh. Number four, I see people like Stephen and Philip being used in miraculous gifts. Number five, I see the prayer of faith healing the sick in, J in James 5. So I'm just trying to follow scripture. So what does this text mean then? That they had a unique role that we don't have. No one's arguing that. Time, gentlemen.
Okay, thank you all for that uh, spirited cross-examination. And so we'll move into closing remarks, gentlemen. And uh, Dr. Brown, we'll start with you, sir. You have five minutes, and then followed by you, Dr. Zacharias. Well, thank you so much for being part of this, all those watching online. Thank you, and thank you, Theodore, for being a gentleman and a scholar tonight. I appreciate that. So Mark 16 would be a great text to get into, but in closing statements, you can't bring in anything new, so I won't do that. But had I thought about your acceptance of it, I would have loved to use that text as well. Maybe another time, sir. That being said, I want to reiterate the points that I made that I believe at no point have been rebutted. We'll start with the fact that Paul gives us an exhortation, not just in 1 Corinthians 14, but also in 1 Thessalonians 5, not to despise prophecies and to rather pursue the gift of prophecy and not to forbid tongues. The argument that historically they happened or didn't happen, again, does not touch on what Scripture says. And we heard even in the cross-examination that while there are explicit texts telling us, do this, there is no explicit text telling us, don't do that. Not only so, the idea, well, it's not happening anymore. Let's say I come to faith in a jungle in Africa, and I'm given a Bible, and I begin reading it. I, I don't know that it's stopped. I'm going to believe what has written. And the argument that it stopped, again, is highly subjective, and there are whole books documenting the ongoing evidence of the charismatic gifts through church history. I even mentioned Augustine in the, in the early 5th century having to change his theology because of miracles. I would say change your theology because of Scripture, but fine, he did because of the miracles that he saw. So that's number one. Number two, Acts, the second chapter, speaks of an outpouring of the Spirit on all flesh in the period of the last days and says the promises to you, in the second chapter, and your children, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God can call. That includes you and me. We're in on that promise. Same spirit. Number three, we also saw no rebuttal, or even attempted rebuttal, to John 14, 12. These are the words of Jesus, which I take very seriously, as, as I know each of you do, in the midst of our differences. I don't question that for a moment, that you're very serious about Scripture. John 14, 12. Again, Theodore is 10 times better Greek scholar than I am, 100 times better. Okay, it's his native language on top of it. John 14, 12. It's very simple. The one who believes in me. It is universal. It's not qualified. If you want to qualify that, you have to qualify the others. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. You'll have to say that that must be qualified as well. Number four, the way God has arranged the body, okay, and everything intertwined. You have teacher intertwined with miracle workers and those with gifts of healing. And you have tongues following administration and helps, these things are tied in and are an ongoing part of the body. I would also point this out, that it's easy to caricature. I could caricature non-charismatics as spiritually dead or skeptics or mockers and say, you're upset with us jumping up and down in church, or I'm upset with you falling asleep in church. Well, that would be an unfair caricature. In the same way, as someone who's been in the charismatic movement for over 45 years, I can write whole books about abuses. I can also point you to the finest people I know on the planet, devoted to Jesus, living holy, godly lives. In fact, world surveys of Christians were done, which found, interestingly, that those who adhered to a charismatic or Pentecostal faith were more likely to hold to the authority of Scripture, more likely to read the Bible on a daily basis, more likely to pray, and more likely to share their faith. So there are abuses, but let's not get into negative caricatures. Let us look, number one, at the word, number two, at the fruit that remains. So if we go back to Scripture, and here's what I appeal to you to do afterwards. Go back to the Bible Get alone, read the scriptures, see what God has commanded, see what he has called for, see what he has promised. And unless you can find something explicit that says it's not to be practiced today, then continue to practice, continue to believe. And unless you know God fully the way he knows you and have that face-to-face -face relationship with him, 
even that Moses spoke with the Lord as a man speaks to his friend back and forth, then though there's still more to come, we have not yet reached that day. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, for listening to us ramble on. Theologians often talk a lot, and sometimes they communicate, sometimes they don't. But I appreciate Michael coming, and uh, thank you for coming and allowing us to have this uh, exchange. Um, Peter, who was one of the apostles, and who was privileged, he was one of the inner three, the inner circle, was, was privileged to see certain things that not all the others got to see. One of those things was the amazing transfiguration of Jesus when they went up on that mountain. And you recall the incident, you know, Jesus is, is revealing, he's not, he's not adding anything to himself, he's revealing through the flesh some of the glory which elsewhere it says he had with the Father before he was incarnated. He never lost that glory, he never gave it up, he never you know, abandoned it, he concealed it. On that instant, he let some of it manifest to such a degree that, that back in the first century, they talked about the clothing being white, brighter than the sun, this kind of language. Well, Peter was so taken with this. He said, when, when Moses and Elijah showed up, he said, let's, let's make the booths, right? Let's, let's just stay here. This is a mountaintop experience. This is wonderful. You know, and they were discussing his exodus, his, his departure, his death, in other words. Okay? And Peter had that experience. And, and I think that that's probably one of the greatest experiences um, that the apostles were privileged to have. When he writes in his second letter, however, he mentions this experience. And it's a phenomenal experience. It's an experience of something so amazing that we would say that, that if, I, if I could just see that, that would be enough. That would be, I could be so close to God. I could be so close to Christ. That would be wonderful. And yet here is what Peter says. He says, in contrast to this, which is not a fable, it's a truth. In contrast to that, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have a more sure word in God's word. This is what is important. Not the revelation, not the experience, not this phenomenon, not this miraculous transfiguration of Jesus, but what you have here. When uh, Erasmus, who published the first Greek Testament in 1516, he wrote a preface. And near the end of that preface, he said that when you read the accounts of the writers, the gospel writers and the letters of the New Testament, he said this, you will know Christ better than if you were to lay your very eyes on him. That's the estimate that he gave of the scriptures. That's why he labored long and hard to get the original text out there so people could read it. Some say Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. If it wasn't for Erasmus, Luther wouldn't have read Ek yeah? By faith. The one who is righteous by faith, or dedigius, the one who is righteous by faith will live. That is what caused the Reformation. And the Reformation was a great period of time in the history of the church where they came up with this slogan that Michael, Michael's been using it, sola scriptura. But sola scriptura is not a slogan you can just hang on to. It's not just a belief that you can say, I affirm it, it is a way of life. It is saying, in regards to all the phenomena that can or have been or ever shall be, I will always stand 
on the side of the word of God. Experience proves nothing. Jesus said, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if someone was raised from the dead. And they try to kill Lazarus when he was raised. There you have it, my friends. I ask you to trust in the full sufficiency of Scripture and to learn from the original, if you can. Amen. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for that. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move into the interesting portion of the evening. And uh, so we have a 45-minute block of time for you all to come and ask questions. So real quick, here, here's how this is going to work. There's a blue tape mark right in the middle there. Dr. Hernandez will be standing vicinity that. Uh, you come forward and talk to him about your question. He will send you forward to me with the microphone. And uh, just some rules of engagement here. So uh, um, I am the holder of the microphone. So unless you're uh, this big kid in the back here, don't try to take the microphone from me. Uh, and, uh, but I, I am the holder of the microphone. And uh, I just got back from uh, my last combat deployment not too long ago. So please don't, don't, don't come at me. <laughs> Uh, and then also, please remember the context of the debate. Please make sure your questions are appropriate to the context of the debate. Uh, try to ref refrain from pontificating. We are not here to listen to you all preach. We are here to listen to these two scholars respond uh, to your cogent and concise questions. So uh, please try to keep your questions appropriate and concise as well. So as many folks as possible who feel led to ask questions can ask their questions. And we'll alternate the questions and the responses. Gentlemen, uh, whoever the question is directed toward will have two minutes. And then the other person will have one minute to respond to that. And again, the intent here is to have as much engagement as possible. So again, uh, let us get in position here. And you guys can I make a line down here. And uh, Dr. Hernandez will send you forward to me. And I see people already posturing. So let's get this party started. Dr. Brown, uh, you mentioned Joel 2.28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, when you spoke about that earlier. And something that you said about, you know, just reading the passage, like when you said when I was a young guy and I just, come, I just read the scripture. So I thought, well, I've learned it's, and it, it shall come to pass afterward, so I looked back to the previous verses. So my question is, the previous verses. Verse starting, I'll just look at 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. So my question is, that passage, is that passage before Christ was crucified or before 70 A.D. even or is that after 70 A.D.? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's both and. It's a wonderful question, sir. So here's, here's what you get into, which is really interesting in the New Testament text, that the authors quote verses from the Old Testament that were expected to be fulfilled at a certain point in the future that clearly had not arrived yet. And yet they realized that the kingdom of God had broken in. It's what we call realized eschatology, as, as I'm sure you know, already and not yet. So the first fruits we have... Just like the many prophecies about the return of the Jewish people from Babylonian exile, Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 4 and other passages, that there will be an exile and there will be a return. And when they return, the glory of God will be there and the Jewish people will serve God with one heart and Jerusalem will never be destroyed and the nations will come flocking. Well, that didn't happen. The return happened, but not everything else happened. The same way the Messiah is coming, Jewish people were looking for him to rule and reign over the earth. Instead, he came and suffered and died. So the kingdom of God has broken in. So promises that are yet for the future, that Israel and the nations will experience in the future, we have the first fruits of them now. So 
That's, what, that's why Peter adds those words, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh. And he says, this is that which was spoken of by Joel. So Peter explicitly says, this is it. And yet we know it still is ongoing. It has a future fulfillment. So it's begun to receive fulfillment. But the ultimate final fulfillment, when everything happens, when the spirits pour out even more greater dimension around the entire world, and there's this massive restoration of Jewish people, that's yet future. How do we know it's going to happen? Because we have the first fruits, because we have the beginning now. Thank you, sir. Dr. Zacharias? Uh, I, just, I just want to say it's not realized the scatology is inaugurated because it's already and not yet, not already and already. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Zach uh, Zacharias. Uh, I had a question. Um, when I was 10 years old, I only read the English Bible, the one I was given. Um, I had a staph infection, a serious staph infection. It had destroyed my white blood cells. And based on, as a 10-year-old, because God saved me when I was a kid, um, and I was miraculously healed um, from my white blood cell count. It was destroyed, and, it, and within, I was supposed to be in the hospital for six, week, uh, six months, and it was miraculously healed, and I was released from the hospital in 12 days. Um, and I've been around churches that believed in the gifting of the Spirit, and I've seen it operate. I've seen it come to pass. I've seen prophecies come to pass, words of knowledge. I had a word of knowledge one time for a friend. It was just bugging me, and I go up to him, and I had no knowledge of it at all. And when I spoke to him, he said, you were correct about what I, what I was going through. So if, if you say that that has ceased today, um, who's behind that? What's going on if it's not God behind it? Well, I appreciate the, the, the story, and I'm, I'm glad that you're well, certainly. Um, but at the end of the day, experience is not an arbiter of truth. And I think Michael would agree with me. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank, thank God, sir, for what you experienced. And yes, the reason you experienced it is because the word of God is true. Because what's written is true. And that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the gifts that Paul spoke of plainly would continue until Jesus returns. I, I believe Paul. I'm simple enough to believe Paul. Because I believe the word, we do see these things happen. Look, it, we experience salvation. We experience forgiveness of sins. We experience going from darkness to light and from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. That experience confirms what is written. So that experience and the experience of hundreds of millions of others with plenty of medical documentation and scientific documentation on every level confirms what we know from Scripture that, of course, the gifts continue. Thank you, sir. Dr. Brown, in your uh, comments, um, you said in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, etc. And you said that is normative for the church today. There are apostles and prophets today. You no, that's not what I said. Okay, what, what did you say, man? Yeah, do you mind if I, yeah. yeah what right. I said was, let's say that apostles and prophets were just first century and unique. Let's go on with the rest. Okay. Because then you said there are no apostles today like them. Right, yeah, exactly. So you, okay. you must either, I said it wrongly, which I don't think I did, or you, you thought I said something different. Okay, okay. Yeah. so are, are there apostles and prophets today? Not in that sense, but the way Barnabas was called an apostle, people sent on a specific mission, church, you know, people like Hudson Taylor, church planters, people that have founded denominations, I see as apostolic people, but are there people that were apostles like the 12? No, of course not. They were unique and only for the first century. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Zacharias? Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Hi. First of all, I really enjoyed the, d the debate. Thank you both. It was a very interesting e evening. Um, se secondly, this question may be addressed to the opposite of you in that, do you believe the other person can be a, f be a full and complete Christian while holding the opposite view? Okay, that's, uh, sir, that's not relevant to the debate tonight, so I suggest that you engage them after the debate at the, uh, at the tables and, uh, and talk. That. Well, that's okay, that's, not, that's uh, just not pertinent to the debate, but great question. Yes, sir.
Uh, this is my question is directed to Dr. Brown here. And I just want to ask you, um, he, he had mentioned that experience doesn't necessarily confirm theology, which I would agree with. But we do know that in the New Testament, the theology was shown to be true by experience. So do you think that the cessationist here is playing a double standard when it comes to the New Testament based on what happens today? Yes, yeah, so... Uh, I don't believe that Theodore or the cessationists are consciously in any way seeking to use a double standard or be duplicitous or deceptive. However, I would say that yes, there is an inconsistency. So I've taught it for decades, you base theology on scripture, not on experience. So we wholeheartedly agree with that. That's why I hold to the theology I hold to because of scripture. Does that mean that experience cannot confirm scripture? Certainly not. I put my faith in the risen Jesus and I'm radically saved and changed and transformed and set free from drug addiction and become a lover of the God I once hated. That experience confirmed the reality of what is written, which then helps me to believe what's written no matter what I feel. If I pray a prayer and it's answered or not answered, I'm a believer either way. If I do what God says in the word and I don't see results, I believe because the word is true. Let every man be a liar, let God be true. Yet we know throughout scripture, it's a consistent, persistent thing that those who put their trust in God encounter him, experience his joy, experience forgiveness, experience freedom, or sometimes healed, sometimes delivered, and that confirms what is written. So there's no contradiction. That's why I say the circle brings us back to the authority of scripture, which causes us to continue to believe. Absolutely. Sir? I'm, I'm not sure of the, the, if I fully understood the question. Were you saying that that cessationists are using a double standard because of what? So explain explain well, your question again. We, we understand that we have to base everything on our on scripture, right? And and but we have to remember that in the New Testament, experience was used to confirm what they were saying. So as they preached the gospel, miracles, healings, and stuff like that. So I think um, I think I'm probably saying this uh, incorrectly, but is there this double standard today that, or today we just have the word now? So then experience is not needed. Uh, in the sense of to spiritual gifts, healing, miracles, and all that sense? Well, yeah, I, b I believe that, you know, I understand your question now. I'm sorry I didn't get it before. Um, yes, the, the, the scripture tells us that miracles will confirm mm -hmm. the word, and we see that completed in the apostles. Yeah, but what about today, though? I don't believe we need that, just like I said before. Peter tells us that even this miraculous transfiguration, we have something more sure in the word. We don't need anything beyond scripture. Very well. Thank you. Oh. Hello, Dr. Zacharias. Um, I have a twofold question. Uh, the first question that I have is, um, it's, they're related to each other. The first part of the question is, what brand of cessationism do you adhere to? I know there's different, like for instance, the early brethren believed in a cessationism that even their cessationism will end and the gifts will start again at some point. Um, they believe after the eschaton, not, not during the modern day period. And then there's others that believe, I, from what I understood, that you believe completely that the cessationism lasts forever. Um, so that's the first person. And also, when did cessationism, when did the gifts cease, in your view, did it cease at 70 AD? Did it cease when the apostles died off? Did it just cease in, you know, during the Council of Nicaea? And um, with that, how do you see all the miracles that happened after whenever you saw it ceased? If it ceased with the apostles, for instance, like Jacob um, in the Talmud, it mentions in uh, Trectic Avodah Zarah, it mentions about a man named Jacob, who it was actually a warning in the, about Jacob, a heretic, who was able to heal sick, and the Talmud actually says and affirms his ability to heal the sick. Or if you're talking about, like, after, uh, if it's after the Council of Nicaea that you see it cease, then about what Dr. Brown had mentioned earlier with Augustine. So that's kind of my twofold question. Okay, the first Sir? part, the kind of cessationism, I believe, is the biblical kind. And in terms of, you know, miraculous things that have happened afterwards, I don't know when they ceased. I, I really don't know to tell you, you know, a date, because Paul doesn't give us a date, but Paul gives us the concept. And of course, once the apostles are gone, there are no more apostles. 
So in theory, every Christian is a cessationist to some degree because there are no more apostles. That's one of the gifts. Does that answer the question? Thanks, sir. Yeah, so of course, there's no such thing as being a biblical cessationist. You have to be contrary to scripture to be a cessationist with, with all risk. Although, certainly a brother. That's, that's not an issue of salvation. Uh, but we do know that miracles happened outside of the apostles while they were alive. We don't know the early church leaders continued to point to those things. And the thing that's so interesting is human nature hasn't changed. The same way the miraculous confirmed the reality of God and showed the goodness of God. And, and when some of the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions on the earth today who have been healed or set free in the name of Jesus found the truth of the word of God. It's an extension of the love of God. He's alive. He's alive. So what's written in the book tells us about a living God who continues to work miracles. And what's amazing is that a, a linchpin passage, 1 Corinthians 13, that was everything in the whole debate to my, to my colleague here, uh, he can't tell us when it happened. It should be so definitive the whole world would know. Of course, it hasn't happened yet. That's why. Thanks, sir. Thank you both for being here. It was very engaging and um, exciting for us to listen and want to jump in and say things. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, Dr. Brown, was about the church and that every gift accentuates the church and helps the people grow and helps us learn and gets us closer to God and helps us believe. Um, uh, you described it a little bit better than I can, but you were saying that all of these workings and all of these gifts make up the church. And I have been a member of a church with gifts, and I've been a member of a church that believes in cessationism. Um, how do you differentiate the church that doesn't have the gift of healings or tongues and the church that does, that has all those gifts? Do you consider them not as much of a church or less of a church or they don't believe as much? How, you, how do you dif differentiate sure. that? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think we recognize we have different strengths and weaknesses in the body. I think we recognize that just like one person's fast and another person's strong and another person's smart, these are all important aspects of who we are. And what I found is, is that one's strength tends to be the other's weakness. That, for example, charismatics can be very strong in faith, but are also gullible. And then I found that cessationists can be very circumspect, but then can be cynical. So I, I think you'll find that the muscles in these different groups, one has stronger leg muscles, another stronger arm muscles. That being said, worldwide, for decades now, where we see the most rapid growth of the gospel in conversion and disciples being made around the world, is among those who believe in the gifts and power of the Spirit for today, so it is very powerful in evangelism, and I would just say that those who haven't seen these demonstrations of gifts or seen God working in these beautiful ways have missed out on something very wonderful and beautiful. At the same time, I'm sure if I sat in Theodore's church, I'd learn a lot, and I'd see strengths in that church that I could learn and bring back to my own. I would just say that we ought to all say, Lord, we want everything that you have to, to your glory and to help a dying world. That's what, Lord, everything you have and want for us that will best glorify Jesus, draw people to your word and, and help us make disciples. That's what we want and that's what we should all pursue together. Thanks, sir. sir. It, it is a very good question because there is this, this kind of leftover in terms of if everything is normative and must continue, then surely churches that do not have these manifestations are somewhat lacking. In this instant, you know, I think Michael is, is trying to be very, very cordial and, and in, in, a, in a good way, I think, trying to be ecumenical. Um, but I think your question needs to be probed because in reality, if, if he comes to my church and my church isn't manifesting the spirit, then the spirit's not there. If it's there, then it has to be manifested in the way that he thinks. And so there has to be this recognition that something's amiss with, with a cessationist group. However, he's being conciliatory. He's being very, very careful in his statements. And I, I mean, I appreciate that, but I think he needs to, he needs to take a stand. 
Time, sir. He needs to be honest. Time. Well, it's kind of interesting because I came to faith at home, honestly, reading the Bible, and it was about a year. And not until God basically I felt in my heart, you know, you need to start searching for a church because it's not about you. I will tell you that I actually saw a lot of scriptures that leaned towards that the gifts were for today. But when I started looking for churches, I've noticed that there was degrees on both ends. There was either too cold or way out there. And that was in itself scary, to be honest with you. But yet, I kept looking for churches that were focusing, you know, something in the middle. My point of the question is this. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says to test all things. How do you deal with that yourself? Because the, even the verse before says about prophecies. Yet, we have that verse there that actually tells us to test all things. What are we testing if we're not doing that? Okay, it's a good question. I, 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 there, there are many things in Scripture that are there, right? He said... For example, let me, let me, this is a roundabout way to answer, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's the same thing as saying, well, we should all try to walk on water like Peter did. We should try to, you know, go through the flames like Daniel did. After all, Jesus had a father, and he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Should everything that they experience be my experience? Not necessarily. And so if prophecies were in the first century, then it's that first century church that has to listen to them and discern and not quench the spirit. Now, the quenching of the spirit is still applicable to me, but I don't have to test prophecies because there are no more. But what are you basing that on what, though? Because 1 Corinthians 13. But even then itself, if you keep reading that, it even expresses even more on that, even when it speaks about tongues and stuff like that. And I know that I've seen both sides, believe me, but at the same time, it seems like we're adding something that's not really there. And I can see both parties doing that. But I'm just saying we got to be true to the word, right? Because the one day we're going to answer to him. And I'm just saying, let's be honest, with are both sides. I don't see it where it actually says it needs to end. And that's where I'm not clear. Honestly, today I saw both sides, but I did not see okay. where it actually says. It says it. Read it again in 1 Corinthians. Got that? Yithi said that. The Greek term is a violent term, meaning not, that God will clear. stop them. God will stop them. Sir? Yeah, so real quick, number one, great question. Of course, you're right. It's adding to Scripture to say that we don't have to test prophecy today because prophecies don't exist because they stopped at some point in time, but nobody knows what point in time. Very weak. Uh, not only so, uh, it reminded me, with all respect, of speaking to a Jehovah's Witness. When you quote Scripture to them, they say, no, no, that was just for the 144,000 sealed. Based on what? So based on what in this book? Nothing. In 1 Corinthians 13, quite flatly, plainly, hasn't come to pass. My pointed questions indicated that. And finally, to be 100% honest, everything I said was 100% honest. I'm conciliatory because that's being honest and truthful. I'm sure there are good things in your church I could learn from. That being said, of course, there's something you're lacking. Yes, no question about it. There's something that you should experience, and if you'll open up your heart to God and believe for it, you'll be amazed at what happened. There are many former cessationists because they said, well, this is in the Word. They believed it, and they experienced it. Time, sir. Again, experience is not arbiter of truth. This really has military order tonight, doesn't mm. it? You guys, amazing job. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's flinching. Moving. It's, it's, it's uh, Michael's question, I think. Um, uh, Jesus said at one point, uh, they will by no means believe unless they see a sign when he was in his own Capernaum. And I was raised in an atmosphere where the, um, it was the full manifestations of the Spirit. Um, my question is, do the working and the manifestations of the Spirit hinge on uh, the baptism in the Spirit? In Hebrews 6, it talks about our, uh, not uh, redoing the elementary principles. And it lists about five things that it considers the elementary oracles uh, in the end of chapter five. Uh, and baptisms, plural, is in there. And then it talks about moving on to, after, and this was after he chided them for uh, being on the milk and not pursuing the meat. The meat being the more powerful things in the spirit that are described uh, just after that. So my question is, do um, the workings and the manifestation of the Spirit hinge on being baptized mm -hmm. in the Spirit? So 
when I came to faith in a Pentecostal church, what we were taught was that you were saved through the blood of Jesus and have eternal life through faith in him, and that there is a subsequent empowerment called the baptism of the Spirit. You'll be baptized in the Spirit not many days hence, Jesus tells the apostles. John will baptize you in water, John baptized in water, but you'll be baptized in the Spirit. So that there is a subsequent act, and that was an act of empowerment for the purpose of the, of the gifting, for the purpose of powerful witness. Um, others have said, no, that's absolutely not scriptural. The moment you're saved, you receive the Spirit, end of subject, you don't receive them in increments and things like that. For me, it's very simple. I'm not gonna argue the case. I'm not gonna say, did you receive a subsequent baptism of the Spirit? I'm simply gonna say, are you walking in the fullness of the Spirit. We know there are certain things Jesus did that say Peter tried to walk on water, but doesn't say anybody else, any of the other apostles walked on water, or any of them turned water into wine, right? And yet there were things that were done repeatedly, healings in his name, demons being cast out in his name, a whole subject we didn't get on tonight because it didn't tie in directly, but demons being cast out in his name, prophetic words given, and things like that. So those clearly by the explicit testimony of Scripture continue. There are hundreds of millions of eyewitnesses verifying that. And if someone said, from the moment I was saved, I, I spoke in tongues, or soon after coming to, to the Lord, he used me in a gift of healing, and I never received the subsequent empowerment, I just don't debate that. I simply say, do you have everything God promised, and are we walking in the fullness of it for the glory of the God and, and for a hurting world? Thanks, sir. Dr. Zacharias. Um, I... I believe every Christian has been baptized by the Spirit because the baptism of the Spirit is not an experience that each one has. It's a, it's a redemptive historical event at Pentecost. It's, it's something that God did for the church. It's not something God did for individuals, and therefore we replicate the experience again and again and again. So everybody benefits from Pentecost who is a believer. Thanks, sir. Um, first of all, thank you. It's been a privilege, and I'm, I have the utmost respect um, to hear how much Scripture is quoted. It makes me want to pass out. So I have the utmost respect for how um, studious you guys are. But I do have a question. Just behind um, motive, uh, I'm from a gobbledygook church, um, which, as you put it, but the reason I say that is not I wasn't making a jab. The reason I say that is because... Um, I have been raised in that, and I have seen plenty of gobbledygook people. And the uh, and to what I think Dr. Brown was saying at one point of the abuses, and I've seen them, experienced them, and I've seen the harm from them. So I'm with you. However, I can't allow the potential abuse to cause me to cut it off entirely. In the same sense of someone could abuse the ability to use a microphone, but. I still should listen to some, and I shouldn't run away from it entirely because of the potential of abuse. And then earlier you conceded, hesitantly, but you conceded that there's nowhere in Scripture that says we need to stop, where the Bible told us to stop operating in these things, which would be a reason. So I'm just asking from a genuine place of what the motive is to, cut, to make everybody stop if the Bible's not told us to stop, as you hesitantly conceded, and then if the potential for abuse is the reason how does that, if, if that's a reason to stop something entirely, then why don't we stop doing all kinds of things because of the potential of abuse? So the motive behind is what that, I'm that, that, Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, being raised in something and experiencing it, again, it doesn't deny the experience, but it's not an arbiter of truth. When it comes to truth, no, 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 uh, something, no, 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 let me finish my answer. When it comes to truth, propositions, okay, are either true or false. Experiences are neither true or false, okay? They're just experiences. They're not arbiters of truth. Now, as to motive, I don't, I don't have a motive of abuse. I never talked about abuse. When I mentioned the gobbledygook, it was, it was in reference to what is going on that is not according to the definition of tongues. Tongues, by definition, are languages. Tongues are languages, not what we see in, you know, the experiences of many today and throughout, you know, the last hundred years or so. So these things, the ecstatic speaking in, you know, the, let's just call it gobbledygook for now, um, is, is not biblical tongues. That's the point. So whatever's going on is irrelevant to the issue. I'm not looking at that and saying, oh, that's not it. I'm looking to what Scripture says, and that defines what tongues are. 
It's the, ling the, the linguistic, it's the specific use, and it's the uh, illustration from the Assyrians. All three point to tongues being languages, real languages or dialects, as we see in Acts. Let's let Dr. Brown yeah, thanks. Uh, respond. Yeah, so number one, you're 100% right. It's violating scripture to forbid tongues, explicit. It's an explicit violation of scripture to forbid tongues. That's number one. Number two, Paul says that if you speak in tongues and an outsider's there, he, he might think in King James, you're barbarian. In other words, it just sounds like bar bar. In other words, they're going to think it's gobbledygook. You know how many countries I've been to and I hear someone translating for me, I think, that's, really, that's not a language. But it's their language. It just sounds different to my ears. But the idea that tongues is always an earthly language is refuted by Paul himself. He says, no one understands you. You're speaking mysteries in the spirit, and there must be someone who has the gift of interpretation, not just someone who knows the language. So are they always known languages? No, in many cases, it's, it's a spiritual language or a language known only to God. But just because it may sound different to our ears doesn't mean it's not a language. That would be an, an arrogant assumption. And there have even been studies done linguistically that say, boy, these tongues seem to have syntax and seems to be a language even though we don't understand it. Time, sir. I'm really nervous, sorry. Um, you referenced Corinthians um, 13 and 14. You offer, also referenced Acts chapter 2. Um, if I recite um, Corinthians 13, 8, it says, Whether these prophe prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Um, when we reference Acts 2, 38, is it reference to baptism and salvation of speaking in tongues? Um, in Ephesians, it says that it is by his grace we are saved mm -hmm. and is not by, um, sorry, I'm nervous, that you we did. are saved by faith. And if it wasn't our faith, it was not. And it's not only it's the gift from God, um, not by our works and that we cannot boast. It doesn't say that I get my new salvation by speaking tongues. So wouldn't that be that the gifts cease? No, God forbid. No one here says you get salvation by speaking in tongues. Of course not. No one says you get salvation by healing the sick. But you get salvation through the blood of Jesus, through faith in his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. That's what salvation comes from. The right. gifts are empowerment that God gives to glorify his name and to help a, a hurting and dying world. Yeah, so if, if you, you referenced Acts chapter 2 a lot tonight. Yeah. But in 238, they reference salvation by speaking in tongues, a gift. No, that's not. It's not. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and you'll receive forgiveness. Your sins will be forgiven, right? And you'll receive the gift of the Spirit, right? And the promises to your children and all that are afar off. So we all, I agree, uh, not in full that, that everyone is baptized in the Spirit, but even if I agree with that, fine. Every one of us, the moment we're saved, receive the Holy Spirit. Do we receive tongues? Not necessarily. Do we receive healing? Not necessarily. But we receive the Spirit and salvation. Now the Spirit works different things in us according to His will and according to our cooperation with His will. But salvation is, God forbid anyone thinks if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, or if you speak in tongues, that makes you super saved. No, God forbid. I don't know anyone that thinks that way. So where would you feel that speaking in tongues now, it would be a gift? Yes. Only if you believe in it? Well, if you don't believe in it, it's going to be hard to receive it. If you don't believe there's a state of Tennessee, you'll probably never vacation here. So everything God does, he does in faith. Look, I know of a group of Southern Baptist women who never heard of tongues that were at a prayer meeting some years ago, and as they were praying, the Spirit fell upon them, they began to speak in tongues, and then they went to the Bible to find out what it is. But normally, people read it, they understand, and then they act in faith. Thanks. Dr. Zacharias, you want to respond? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure where the lady's coming from, but I, I've encountered people in my lifetime that, um, you know, they, they will demand that if you're a true Christian, you have to speak in tongues. So, I, you know, I've encountered that. But again, that's, that's talking about experiences, and they don't really add to the discussion. So I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I, I'm not sure why you bring up that question. Uh, I couldn't tell if, if, you th if you think it's necessary or if you don't. I, I don't understand what the purpose of the question is. I, I guess the reason why I bring that question up is because 
um, if the argument is whether the gifts have ceased or not, a lot of like charismatic and apostolic beliefs believes that that you are confirmed as your salvation by speaking the gift okay. of tongues. Um, yeah, I, I don't in, think I don't think I don't think Michael is of that category. So he was clear on that. If you're struggling with salvation over whether you have tongues or not, I would say just look to Jesus. You know, the author and finisher of your faith. That's Amen. where you find assurance. Amen. Not in some manifestation. Look to the scriptures. But the gifts have ceased or not. <laughs> that's what we're he says, debating. He says no, I say yes. That's, that's what it's agree. all about. <laughs> Look to Jesus. We agree. Look to Jesus. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Uh, Two-part question. So if, if we took away the assumption that the, when that which is perfect has come is recognized as the canonized scripture, which that's interpretation, if we, if we didn't have that on the table, where would you stand with cessationism? It's on the table. I'm sorry. We can't take it out. Well, oh, it's part of the Bible. I, I, I understand it's your interpretation to say when that which is perfect come, oh, that reference to Scripture. It doesn't say that, so you're inferring that. Well, I've, I've tried to demonstrate that the, from the Greek text, the partial and the complete, it's not perfect. It's not perfection. The word doesn't mean that. The word means complete. So... Let me, let me just go on and I'll give you the broader, broader page. We're, we're talking about love in this chapter. Uh -huh. And that apparently the gifts, you're very well corrective nature of Corinthians. We're talking about love in this chapter. And love is the bonding. Faith works by love. Love is the bonding. Could that which is perfect tie to 1 John 4, where it says God is love and perfect love cast out fear? Could it be that when God comes, I, it, Dr. Brown may correct this, but Jews in the, in, that worshiped in the temple when the glory, of Shekinah glory of God would come down above the Ark of the Covenant. They would call that the state of perfection. When Paul's using that word, could it infer the returning of God to the earth, which is going to come and, and be here for eternity? Could it be that at that point, and it's really not perfection, canonized scripture, it's the return of God's kingdom to this earth, and that's a state of perfection where all those things vanish? We're talking about love. Couldn't perfect represent God who is love and perfect love cast out all those other things? I, I don't know how you make those exegetical connections, but I, I'm just trying to stay within the text and exegete the text itself. Now, I, like I said, the metaphors are metaphors. They're figurative language. So you can't have part of it being metaphoric and the other part literal. That's an inconsistency. So if it's all f f uh, figurative, then it, it makes sense. The point is about revelation. It's about the revelatory gifts. It's about God giving piecemeal, in part, ekmerus, and then when that, which is complete, not perfect, complete, that's the meaning of the word. So once you have that, you see it's a completed revelatory process. So we don't need the piecemeal anymore because we have the whole thing. Browser. Yeah, so number one, you could take away any one text I used, and I'll use another text, take that text away, I'll use another, because it's taught through so many scriptures in the overall testimony scripture, black and white plain, that of course the gifts continue. That's one. Two, as we saw, 1 Corinthians 13 cannot possibly refer to completion of the canon. We don't even know when this thing allegedly happened and the gifts allegedly ceased. And Theodore himself acknowledges he does not know God the way God knows him. It doesn't say we'll have a Bible, but know God. And then fourth... There's a good reason, there's a really good reason that this interpretation that has been the linchpin of everything that Theodore has put forth is almost non-existent in church history until it began to be used as an argument against the modern charismatic movement. There's a good reason for that. And you, that's why you'll hardly ever find it. And that's why it's increasingly not used because it's, it's just not what Scripture says. Thanks, sir. No, that one's to Michael, I think. Well, Oh, that's good. Yes. Oh, okay. How about we each For get Dr. two minutes? <laughs> um, I would like to hear both of your take on this. Um, it's, in, it's about the Great Commission in uh, Mark 16. When Jesus tells the 11, he tells them, go into all the world and pro proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. 
They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So in the commission, he says, whoever believes, these signs will follow them. How, how, how do you view that? Who's the whoever? Well, I just believe, I'll give, I'll give Michael a minute and a half rather than two and one, so we'll have equal time on this, okay? <laughs> and that was 10 seconds, so give me 10 seconds extra. Um, I, I believe that the, uh, the passage is, is a genuine one. I believe that it's text, it's, it's scripture. I affirm the, the Texas Receptus, so I, I, I believe it. But I also believe that the fulfillment of it happened in the first century in the, in the, apostol in the apostolic era. That it was, it was fulfilled because it was talking about the apostles and what they would do. Excerpt. That's it. Yeah, well, well, thank you for bringing it up so, so I get to address it. I, I believe it's authoritative words of Jesus, even though not the original ending of Mark. But yeah, it's clear. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And these signs will follow those who believe. To say it's the apostles, it's the opposite of what the text says. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And these signs will follow those who believe. So who is that? Believers. And that's why it continues to happen around the world today. I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a, a Palestinian guy. A Palestinian Muslim came to faith shared the gospel with his parents. His father said, we need to have a big meal. They poisoned him at dinner. When he didn't die, the father got saved. So these things continue to happen. Believers are laying on this, hands on the sick. Demons are being driven out. If, if I wanted to start to talk testimonies tonight to glorify the Lord with that, we'd need a thousand years just to talk about the ones that I know about, you know, and that I've heard about. So yeah, a wonderful text. And if we take it as scripture, slam dunk, end of subject right there. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, sir. One more. From the videographer. All right, so you get equal time on me with this one then, sir. This is for you, Michael. Oh, yeah, I forgot about touching the mic. Sorry. Don't grab the mic. Yeah, you almost, you almost got into a throat hole there, I think. My, Choke hole. Uh, Dr. Brown, can you explain uh, to me John's warnings at the end of Revelation concerning prophecy and how that would coincide with prophecy being a continuation? Sure. So he warns against anyone adding to the prophecies of this book. So first and foremost, he's giving a warning about adding to the book of Revelation. But if we accept in the providence of God this is the end of Scripture, the end of the New Testament, then it is an explicit warning about adding to the Word of God. So we know prophecies continued after that period. We know the church, early church leaders that are accepted by everyone talked about the gift of prophecy because no one confused the gift of prophecy with written Scripture. So if someone claims to be adding to Scripture, yeah, there are curses on that person. And if someone takes away from scripture. Yeah, their, their name will be taken away from the book of life. So I take that with the utmost seriousness, but to reiterate, prophecy that was part of the Bible was designated by God as such, but there were many prophecies given in ancient Israel not recorded in scripture, many prophecies given in the early church, many prophecies given through church history, many prophecies given today. At best, there's something the Lord is saying. For example, I don't know you at all. I say, yes, the Lord's, I feel the Lord wants you to, to take that job in California. You say, I can't believe we've been fasting and praying. Should we take that job to California? That does not add to the Bible. It doesn't add anything to the Bible. So we put everything in its proper place, test it. But just like ancient prophecies in the early church after Revelation did not add to the Bible, prophetic words today do not add to the Bible. It stands alone, the one and only word of God that tests us. We don't test it. Thanks, sir. Uh, what he just gave as an illustration is not an illustration of prophecy, however. Prophecy is speaking a direct revelation from God. And if it is a direct revelation of God, it's authoritative, infallible, and binding for the time. Why is it not in Scripture? That's a good question because, you know, obviously there were things that were said, but having a hunch is not the same as prophecy. Having, you know, giving advice is not the same as prophecy. So... Yeah, I, I just don't see that. Prophecy is speaking the word of God. That's why there's no more prophecy, because the Revelation is a final, a final book, and you know, in God's providence, I think there's an extension of the principle that this is the capstone, this is the end, this is the, the, you know, everything that needs to be said has been said, and this is the end. You do not add to this book, but you do not also pretend that God is still speaking. The principle is the same, because if you do, then you have something that's equal to Scripture. And I would say the Revelation says no. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, this concludes our time.